Here we go. Here we go. It's Tuesday. I don't even know what day it is. Oh, oh, look at this. It's February 21st, and it's the 21st day of this trial. I'm not joking. I just like it when coincidences work out. It is the 21st day of the Murdoch trial, and we are getting into what the defense says is a week long defense case. Just for a refresher, in criminal cases, the prosecution goes, they have the burden of proof. Then the defense goes, poke holes in the prosecution's case. Then the prosecution has rebuttal witnesses and they get to make a rebuttal case. Uh huh. And then closing arguments and then jury deliberation. We are in the beginning of week five of what the attorneys promised the judge was a three-week trial, but we know that these attorneys have no self-awareness. So I'm not surprised that they said, hey, it's a uh, it's a three-week trial. It's not, it's not, it's a five-plus week trial. The problem is they promised these jurors that it was a three-week trial, and these jurors are going to start getting salty real quick. Um, or have life events come up All where right. you start losing them. They are calling court to session right now. Judge Newman's about to take the bench. Let's see if anything happened over the weekend as we are getting into day 21. Remember the last time we came back from the weekend, two jurors were excused because of illness. He's got a whole notebook and a bunch of law. Good morning. Oh, what did they ask for? What did the attorneys do, Your Honor? I have two issues. I don't know if you all have something. Um, Uh-oh. Two issues is not good. First, we have a juror who's not feeling well and who... Uh, it's like I just said that. ...is at a doctor's appointment. Juror number 441. This is going to happen. The juror is not here. They are low on alternates. The longer a trial goes, juror attrition becomes a huge concern. We will need to replace that juror with an alternate. As I understand it, this is a juror who took the place of another juror. This is already an alternate. Um, it's going to leave them with place of one alternate, I think. If they run out of jurors. Come in. State or the defense. If they run out, if they get under 12, it is a mistrial and they have to start over with another I apologize, you're on 441. trial. Maybe someone heard it from your side. <laughs> Question B, is she indicated she's too ill to be here or she's just gone to a doctor's appointment and could be here by? Not feeling well. They have doctor's appointment. I haven't spoken with the juror. This note came from someone. Would it come from the clerk's office? From the jury coordinator. Poot is worried about it. He should be. That's a fair question. Could they be here in an hour? Are they actually sick? Or are they just not feeling well? Do they have the vid? Documents we haven't really looked at in four weeks. Can you have the jury coordinator come up? Um, Because here's a problem. If the juror could be back, and could be back in like an hour, it might be worth it to push, to push, um, for that juror to come back because if the juror is just a little under the weather, you don't want to necessarily sub them out. Once the juror is substituted out, then you cannot bring them back. So once the juror is excused, you're done. So it's like you're, you're limiting down the rest of the alternates that you have maybe needlessly. So they're bringing the juror coordinated up. The judge is so sick of their shit. Did you hear what he said to the prosecution? They're like, excuse me, on our four, four, one. He said, maybe someone from your side heard. Creighton, the judge wants you to listen. They keep muting the mics as the attorneys are at All council right. table. Your Honor, that's that's fine with proceeding. If that's the court's uh, um, desire to proceed on. Certainly Creighton, that's a terrible plan, plan, buddy. Proceeding as opposed to what? I mean, <laughs> she's at the doctor's appointment. I don't know if there's if that was something that would, would keep her out for a while. Um, that would be the only thing. But uh, obviously, she's not here and not feeling well, so... Um, that's why we have the alternates. And, and your honor, um, and I know you're going to tell the jury, day 21, um, and we'd like to not be doing day 31. And if this delays it, we, I mean, we sit here and wait to find out what her health condition is. Uh, it might go on for a while. So we'd rather go ahead and proceed. Oh. All right, madam, the juror, the jury is being dismissed. Uh, so the juror is being dismissed. Your, your honor, can I 
make a yes, statement right quick. Did, yes, sir. We, um, right quick. We think the defense will be rested. We will rest our case by Friday, probably mid late day Friday. And then I don't know if the state has any reply. <laughs> we're looking at finishing early next week. I, I don't know if it makes sense to notify the jury of this anticipated schedule. And that creates that we know we're going to lose some people if, if they're aware right now that we may be finishing Smart. early next week and we'd be coming up short. I just don't want to come up short. That's that Jim's right. And he should have stepped on Poot. They should push back on the juror that's at the doctor. Of course, that's all predicated on the juror not having COVID. And reply. Here, we will gain it up. Sorry. Sure. Did you receive a call from a juror or some communication from the juror? They're talking to the jury coordinator. Tell, tell us about it. Stand and tell us about it. All right. So it's the same as the other juror who um, ended up in the emergency room and we replaced that juror. So. I, I think we're at three alternates. So we we're two or three a, alternates we'll left. to select by lot the next juror. All right. They're replacing the juror. That'll leave what? Two? Out of the three, we need another okay. juror. Any objection to the clerk randomly pulling out? The number out of the box. None from the state, Your Honor. Nothing from the defense, Your Honor. Let's see who we have. And we're down to two alternates. Tell us who it is. Juror number. Juror number 530. 530 will be joining this jury. I can't turn this up too much because the, cur the clerk's desk is not mic'd. So we're just picking up alternate sound in the courtroom. And once the mics come on, it's going to be so loud. Um, I had a conversation this weekend about YouTube notifications. All right, juror number 530 will become part of the uh, regular panel. Here is what was recommended. For those of you that have notifications on for the channel, turn on all notifications. Secondly, uh, I've been receiving uh, over the past oh, shit. two to three days. Don't communicate with uh, the court. Emails. Oh, God concerning a social media post by Mr. Griffin. Oh, God. Commenting upon uh, Who would do that? testimony and uh, quality of the investigation by the state. Somebody find it. And, uh, and uh, where it did Griffin post? On my Twitter feed this morning. What? Jim Griffin's posting Griffin, on Twitter during trial? Is this part of your defense strategy? Or? What the fuck, Jim? <laughs> your Honor, all I did was retweet an article that was published in the Washington Post. I didn't put any comment. I didn't make any statement. I just retweeted the article that's in the newspaper. That's all I did. <sighs> I'll find it. We had an NBA player who retweeted an article um, uh, professional basketball player who retweeted an article um, that resulted in him being suspended from the NBA for yep. about 10 days and um, he it cost him about $10 million in salary. Jim's uh, so learned nothing from Amber Heard. Retweeting um, is the same as, for, to some, as, as, as if you your tweet as if you're uh, speaking it appeared i didn't know that well uh, i mean i'm not a twitter friend of yours uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, just appeared on my uh under twitter first thing up this morning was you uh, holy we shit had the lawyer who had a similar name to a person with a similar name to our lawyer witness and it was someone else by the same name in your interest, in the, your instance, it's your name and your picture. So we know it's you, Jim. Retweet the article. No question about it. Damn it, Jim. I've been reviewing uh, Rule 3.6. That's why I pulled up the case that. law. Um, and oh, shit. Um, whereas the rule Trial does not publication. specifically state that uh, the lawyers are prohibited from. Um, criticizing 
witnesses during the course of the trial or commenting on uh, a case that they're actively participating in, uh, I think it goes against the spirit of, of the law, of the rule, and it doesn't pass the field test. So that's, um, to quote Judge Kiner again, it didn't pass the field test, so uh, you should not post. Oh, he he made a statement. Or repost anything that uh, would give me or the general public uh, or hopefully never land in the hand of a juror who, um, you know, uh, the jurors were instructed not to discuss the case. And uh, um, obviously that did not extend to the lawyer lawyers, but I, it, yeah, Seems like more than a retweet practice. to me. And um, it could easily lead to modification of our rules that might specifically address something like that. Oh, they're going to so, modify the rules of professional conduct to address that. you specifically, Honor, Jim. I will not retweet anything. You made a comment. Or tweet anything. I agree with the chat. The trial is over. Yes, sir. You should. Ugh. The comment Anything says, Alex, the jury comes. Alec Murdoch trial reveals a sloppy investigation. State, Your Honor. It could be the title of the article. Nothing for the defense, Your Honor. Okay. You may bring the jury. Bring the jury. Bring the Twitter. Twitter has entered the chat. The NBA has entered the chat. Um, I didn't expect this. It's absolutely wild. I'm going to go retweet it right now. I'm going to, pardon, I'm going to go quote tweet it. The judge definitely made a statement. I'm going to go see if I find this Washington Post article and go to share it on Twitter if it... Oh, the Washington Post is going to make me fucking pay for it to do this experiment. It seems like he added more... We're going to have to just look for ourselves. Hold on. Hold on. We're looking for ourselves. We're looking for ourselves. Um, Because it seems like he commented on this. It seems like it's more than the uh it seems like it's more than the title of the article and then we'll get back to judge newman bringing the jury alec murdoch trial reveals a sloppy investigation opinion alec murdoch trials reveals a sloppy investigation i don't know if he titled this because normally when you share the article it just stays within the article box so he might have copied the article but it might have um he good morning it's it is the title ah. day number 21. I did not expect now the defense's case. That was As tweeted on February 18th know, at 7:37 a.m. is missing, absent. Um, and that juror uh, This jury's going to worry that that juror has, has the vid. Replaced, and that juror is being <sighs> replaced. The judge is exhausted with these people. Number 530. Yeah, I think he quote tweeted the article title. Juror number 530 not. And that's more than just a retweet. All right, juror number 530, because you're one of the first 12 now. What we've all learned from Debbie Heard is member if, you retweeted retweeted panel, it, it if you just retweeted it, it would show up that you retweeted it from the Washington Post. It wouldn't show up with the title. With our case so that and, is uh, absolutely a quote tweet. Agreed. We will not have much more attrition. Um, we're in the defense case. We're hearing that we should be. Goes. We'll be a full week in the defense we'll case. See now with the defense's case. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense will call. Richard Alexander Murdoch Jr. Oh, I almost had a Buster fucking Murdoch. heart attack. They're calling Buster first? The way my heart stopped when he said Richard Alexander Murdoch. Oh, hold on. I got to go text the text crew. Wait, wait. There's people I need to notify. Buster's taking the stand first? Oh, there won't be much commentary. We're just going to listen to what the fuck Buster has to say. You'll have a seat up on the witness stand. Adjust your chair and your microphone. And if you'll state your full name and spell your last name. Richard Alexander. Richard Alexander Murdoch Jr. When he said Richard Alexander -U Murdoch. D-A-U-G-H. I go by Buster. Oh, I think we're aware at this point, Buster. But thank you Mr. for Murdoch, being is, thorough. Mr. is your father sitting over here at defense table yes sir holy um, shit tell the jury uh a little bit about yourself where you're born where you raised did you go to school. wade hampton high school right. um 
So my name is Buster, 26 years old. I live in Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. I, I was born in Savannah and lived in Beaufort for about two years when I was a little child. We moved to Hampton I don't in know about I, 2000, and I grew up in Hampton, went to Wade Hampton High School. I don't know if this is a good idea. And after high school, I went to a small college in Spartanburg called Walford. I don't know how I feel about this. Did uh, Is the prosecution going to ask him about getting Maggie? kicked out of law yes, school sir. for cheating? And your brother, Paul? It's yes, character. sir. The, uh, when you moved to Hampton, uh, do, you, do you remember how old you were when you first uh, Why does it matter, Jim? Uh, three, or, three or four. Okay. And did you, and did you live in Hampton, um, in a house with- Jim sounds nervous. In the city limits? Yes, sir. The town limits? Yes. What the and fuck does it matter? For, with your mom and dad and brother for how long? I don't know for, how this is going to go. This kid's been through, whether his dad wrong. did it, didn't do it. 20 years. Right. His life has been completely the, uh, upended. You, what schools did you go to coming up through uh, in Hampton County? Would, would you go to grade school? Went to Ben Hazel Primary School, Hampton Elementary, Elementary School, North District Middle School, Wade Hampton High School. Okay. And as you were... Um, Growing up, what, what were your interests, Buster? Um, sports, playing sports, doing things outdoors, hunting, fishing. And, and was your father involved in those interests with you? Yes, sir. And was your mother also? Yes. So this is yes, just sir. all going to be character. And, and, and in what way? Well, my father coached every Little League team I played on up until – I started playing for the schools in which had a coach. And what, what about Paul? What, what were his interests growing up? Paul's interests were outdoors, mostly um, hunting, fishing, playing around in the woods. Right. Did, did he also play sports at times? He did. Yeah, he played basketball and baseball. Did your dad coach him as well? He did. And would your parents attend all of you're in Paul's sporting events as you're growing. Every game. And also, it was a rarity for them attending every game is not the sign of a good parent. If they had to, they would call and explain. And Right. And um, I am I am nervous about the cross. At some point in time, too. did your parents buy this property off Moselle Road? Yes, sir. Do you remember roughly when that was? Right around 2012, I think. I would have been a sophomore in high school. And, and when that property was first purchased uh did you move out to moselle or are you still living in hampton so we had a house in hampton and also too, purchased the property at moselle which had a house and also, for the I beginning my, stages of owning moselle I heard hampton was much. still working as our primary residence but i believe it was hurricane matthew or one of the hurricanes came through and blew a bunch of uh, pine trees over on the house so it had to get work done to it and from that point we moved out from hampton to i need Moselle to hear more about the arson while the house was getting fixed at and the house more or less it, it just kind of it never transitioned back to hampton it just they're trying to humanize like Moselle became the primary residence they're and during this time did your family also have a house at edisto yes sir uh how frequently would you Tell us more about your three houses. Very frequently during it's going to help summertime. the jury feel like they're one Almost of you. every weekend. And when your family essentially relocated uh, to Mo the Moselle property, making it primary residence, were you still living at home in high school? Or remember how old you were at that point in time? Yeah, I'm sorry, Jim. Will you say that again? <laughs> were you living at home at that point in time? Is that while you were still in high school? Or yeah. School? You, remember, you remember when... The when you transitioned to Moselle I think Jim and started this. staying there basically full time during the school year. Um, so when I was still in high school, we were living in the Hampton house and then I'd gone off to college, Okay, which is when the stuff happened and, and they moved out to Moselle. What so stuff? I was living in at college. And when did you go off to college? 2014. Okay. So sometime after around 2014, family relocated to Moselle, for the most part, That's because right. of the hurricane damage. Yes, that? sir. Okay. Tell the jury uh, a little bit about 
the Moselle property? I know they've heard a fair amount, but I think you probably know it better than anybody. Yeah, so the Moselle property is it's roughly seven, roughly seventeen hundred acres, and a lot of that is really not even accessible. It's a lot of swamp lands, a lot of stuff that you just you know no road systems or anything like that. But a a big portion of it is is you know, has road systems and everything. And it's, it's a big property. It's broken up into several different parcels that border each other. And I love that we've gotten the know, parcel have delineation. 20, 20 some odd deer stands, dove fields, duck ponds, just all over the property. So what, what type of hunting? Um, this has got to be hard for him to brother and your father do at Moselle. Everything deer, duck, quail, dove, Hogs. You have, you have a duck pond? We have a duck, we have a duck pond. Okay. And and the, the hunting was, did you have a lot of um, friends come out and hunt as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, now the jury has seen a uh, aerial view of the property, and there's a main house. There's Tell shed kennels, the and, then, and there's a house sort of right on Moselle Road. What's, what's, what do you call that house? That's the cabin. The cabin. And and did, the did place you live that in the cabin with friends over summers at some point in time? I that, did. The summer of that cabin, my sophomore year, after my sophomore year, me and oh, two of my buddies lived a little in peaky. the cabin. Okay. And who are those buddies? Uh, Nolan Tootin and Rogan Gibson. Okay. It's interesting. And my parents the, have never uh, been like, we've got a spare house. Have your friends come live here? So we've. It's um, just a different life. And I don't know if that's going to help or hurt in this case. Than, we've heard about I think the jury hogs knows. and pigs on the property. Can you tell the jury a little bit about that? About the hogs? Yes, sir. We had a lot of hogs. And if you don't know, hogs are very destructive to a piece of property. You know, we plant food plots for the deer, plant the fields for the doves and the ducks. And they basically go through and, and ruin it all. Maybe they don't want you to so, shoot the deer. I don't know. Maybe the hogs are the, like, hey high population of hogs we seems like trap you know would frequently go out and, and hunt them try to okay. I don't know. try Maybe. to cut the numbers down a little <laughs> bit did um what kind of guns did you have there at moselle we had a lot of guns did you have shotguns we did jenny shotguns. i don't think they will ask about shotgun? Shotguns, i don't shotguns, i'm very interested to see what they ask about and i hope they ask shotguns. in not a horrifically yeah, aggressive way. They need to just ask the questions. Have on the a lot. Just ask the questions. Some of them. Yeah, 270, um, 270 short mag. We know what rifles they have. 308, 308, 243, 223. Oh, loves wood heat. I don't think Buster gallon. can be a lawyer after getting kicked out of law school and for what, cheating. I don't think he's getting back ammo to law school. Keep on the property. Well, I mean, all ammo is for those, for those calibers. Sure. And where were the guns kept primarily? In the gun room at the main house at Moselle. And was there a pool table in the gun room? There was. Okay. Were we there saw times when guns were left elsewhere on the property? Yes. Where else on the property would guns be left? Well, just just myself. I mean, I've I've left them up at the shed before. I've left them on. I'm gonna I'll golf switch feeds in a little bit. Use that day. Left them in a truck. I mean, guns would just. Not always find their way back to the gun room. But the peaking audio was killing about, me last um, week. How about Paul? How was he with uh, securing guns? When I switch feeds, we'll get the good. closed captioning back. What do you mean by that? He would, Paul, Paul left guns probably more on the property than anybody else. And just, and sometimes if he, like sometimes he would use my gun and then he would leave it and then I'd have to track it down. Right. Did um, Paul carry guns in his truck? He did. Uh, would he keep his truck locked up? No, no, not all the time. Okay. Did at some point in time you and, and Paul receive? They didn't ask him what he's doing now. Christmas? Yes, sir. Which is Remember interesting. Roughly, was that 2016 or 2017? Sounds right. Okay. And um, and what color was your 300 blackout? It was black. And. Did your brother you steal it all the time in this courtroom during the entire trial? Yes, sir. And the, the jury's seen a black 300 blackout. Is that yours? It is. That is my 300 blackout. Was that the one you got for Christmas? Yes, sir. And what colors was Paul's? Paul's was black and tan. 
and we say black and tan, what part was tan and what part was black? So I, so the receiver would have been tan and the, I think, and barrel would have been tan. What part would have been black? Stock maybe. Okay. And so it, yours was all black, his was black and tan. That's right. Um, what happened to his that he got for Christmas in 2016? Um, his gun was apparently stolen, lost, taken. Um, yeah. Do you, uh, how do you know that? That's just what Paul told me. Did what happened to your gun after Paul's was stolen? My gun became, you know, what we would both use. And would um, what did that create some? confrontation between you two at times yes sir and and what why well kind of like i just touched on so he would use it he's Buster not very good about putting it back out where he found it of law school for perjury. i leave it somewhere i go back and you know want to get it and it's not which there. is highly relevant did, to um, him testifying and giving truthful testimony did did you uh notice were you aware that paul got a replacement at some point in time no sir well, you heard really about courtroom. Yes, sir. Okay. But up to that point, you he didn't know there was a replacement. Did you ever see Paul use the replacement? No, sir. I've never seen a replacement. Really? So every time in your presence, Paul was using a 300 blackout, which one would it be? Mine. That's odd to me. There's i uh, I'm not going to pull these guns out, Buster, but there's a uh, been just discussion and the jury has seen a 12 gauge Benelli with a Mojo uh, sticker on it. Whose gun is that? That's mine. And because what's Mojo? Mojo is a brand of uh, decoy. It's it's a taco place in Middle Tennessee that's is, is fucking it's, delicious. You know, so you buy wood duck Mojo and it sits on a pole, but the wings are motorized. So it it's to repli replicate, you know, a, a more alive duck. And and did you, why, why is your but now they have a mojo sticker on Because I bought a mojo decoy and in the box it came with a sticker and I put the sticker on the gun barrel. And so that way you know that's your gun. That's right. Um, the not the knowing about the, the replacement when his friend was talking about citing them mojo in is weird. Benelli, when it was seized was was loaded. Did you did you frequently put the gun away loaded? Yes, sir. Why? Other witnesses saw the replacement. I, you know, oh, plagiarism, not perjury. Sorry, point. Okay, just you know, I say, thank you. Future, my I brain is just in court today, and yesterday's uh, podcast, I said perjury a I lot. Think it was loaded with a three plagiarism, and a three and a half inch that. turkey load. Do you remember that you would load that gun with a three inch and a three and a half inch? Yes, sir. And why would you do that? Um, I do that because when I go turkey hunting, it, the goal is to you know, get the turkey close to you and shoot it in the first try. But if I were to miss and the turkey my, goes running that's away. That's my bad. Thank and you, I try Chad. To shoot it again, I put a bigger shell, larger shell behind the smaller one for that purpose. Okay. And that's something you commonly did. Yes, sir. Did did you ever load in a twelve gauge, twenty gauge, twenty eight gauge, a buckshot followed by a bird shot? No, sir. I've never done that. Um, you ever known anybody to do that? No, sir. You know of any reason to do that? No, I can't think of any reason to do that. And It'll be interesting have you to ever see loaded if they ask him. Gun, a buckshot, followed by. They ask him about how much he's talking to his dad in custody. Still waterfowl, waterfowl pellet. I have not. You know anybody to do that? No, sir. You know any reason to do that? No, sir. Buckshot, bird shot. You ever seen any guns loads. on your property loaded in that fashion? No, sir. Buckshot with some sort of bird shot right behind it. No, sir. Did your brother find your dad's pills? Because the prosecution's going to ask Jim. You should just get it out of the way. The jury's heard um, testimony about goings and comings, which way you go in and go out at Moselle. How many entrances were there at Moselle? Two entrances. And will you describe the two entrances? So the main entrance is pretty much straight out of the front door of the house. Um, you would go down a dirt road and then you would come up on uh, big brick columns. And that's what I refer to as the main entrance. But down by the kennels is another entrance. And that one is a little bit different. That one has the mailbox. Yeah, that um, one has the mailbox. Beside it. 
and those are those are the two entrances. Okay. So let's talk about coming on to the property. Which um, which which entrance? Jim's not leading. Coming so that's on good. to the property, would your mother normally take? Mm, I I would say normally everybody took the main entrance, in unless that there was a reason that you needed to go down the other one. Which for her, her her reasons of going down the other one would be the mailbox, and also when we got packages delivered from Amazon, they actually would be or would go to the shed as opposed to the, to the house. What? So your deliveries would go not, not to the yellow or whatever white. Not to the house big house you lived in, but down at the shed. That's right. Okay. Which is probably the original house now, on the property that they call leaving the Moselle, the property. Uh, which way would you, Alex, your mom, Paul normally go? leaving Moselle out of the main gate. Okay. He's had lots of phone calls with his dad. And if you're going to Almeida, which, which way do you turn coming out of the main gate to the right? And we know that Alec is sitting there grinning. Um, we will see about shifting Shifting feed so the, we can um, see some of that. They've shifted back and forth a little. One of in, these days, folks. In 2020, 20, um, During the summer months, where did your mother prefer to stay? At a staff. And where were you staying, say, in the spring, summer of 2021? Where were you living? Um, sp spring, uh, Moselle. And then uh, summer, where'd you move to? Or um, I was down at Edison a lot in the summer. Okay. And then, um, and where was Paul living in the say spring of twenty twenty one? Um, spring of twenty or twenty one. Twenty one. Oh God, my cousin that, Vinny's doing the cross examination of Buster. The in the spring of twenty twenty one, where were you living? Spring of 2021. Uh, uh, Do you have an apartment in Columbia? Yes. Yes, I did have an apartment you in Columbia. Split time between Columbia and Why is he Moselle? just leading now? Yes, sir. And you have a girlfriend? Yes, sir. Oh, he's just leading. And then in the summer of 2021, well, in, in June... Uh, where were you living? I'm trying um, not to be conspiratorial, but he looks real Columbia proud that his kid never saw that brand or blackout. And who lived in Rock Hill? Uh, my girlfriend's mom. Instead of being heartbroken that his kid is testifying in, in his murder spring trial. Spring up through June of 2021, where was Paul living? In Columbia. He had an apartment in Columbia? Yes, sir. And, and was, he at, was he enrolled at University of South Carolina in the spring of 2021? Yes, sir. Okay, and then once school got out, do you know where Paul relocated to? Um, no, not exactly. I know that. <clears throat> I mean, I think he went down to live with John Marvin. He was working for him for the summertime. And who's John Marvin? My uncle. And what kind of business does John Marvin have? He has a rental business and he sells Kubota tractors. And, and where kind does of he have um, uh, store locations? Uh, one in Okatee, one in Hampton. And was Paul working at the Okatee location? Yes. Okay. It's um, interesting that Jim just jumped right in and they're not going to object to stuff like that. It just doesn't up. matter. Did, did you and I, I never heard that before. Mother Thank you and all. Brother Paul do a, a lot of things with your mother's family, though. When I the say I'm a city stuff. girl, yes, I'm not sir. lying uh, like Jim. What type of things would y'all do? <clears throat> well, we'd gather every every holiday. And, you know, other than that, we would do trips together. We would go down to Key West, go over to um, my Aunt Mary and Uncle Bart's lake house, river house. Just right. stuff like that. Take trips, family trips. And, and I'm, I'm just going to pull up on the screen, Doug, uh, Defendant's Exhibit 122, which is 
in evidence, Your Honor. Um, and Buster, take a look on the screen, and and I believe your Aunt Marion testified about this. Can you tell the jury what this photo is? This is a photo of me and my brother and my mom and my dad. And and was this taken in, uh, I think, May 21? You were up at for nope. a baby shower, is that right? Yes, sir. And where, where was this? So this is in... Um, this is at Lake Kiwi in a community called the Reserve. Okay, and and y'all are visiting with whom? Uh, with my aunt and uncle, Aunt Marion, Uncle Bart. And for what purpose? Uh, for my oldest cousin's baby shower. All right. And um, and was events like this unusual or no, sir. frequent? Or common. And was your your father close with? Maggie's dad, your grandfather, Papa T, is it? Been They're going to have to ask him, did you know your dad was stealing? Could you yes, have ever sir, imagined was. it? What the cross is going to be. They would do a lot together. Um, too painful, but it's going to be. For a long time, there was a. A little icky. My grandfather had a um, camping trip, and Papa T frequented the camping trip. He liked that. Dad and Papa T would go to Carolina sporting events together, play golf together. And did. Did you spend a lot of time with your dad and, and your grandfather, Papa T? Yes, sir. You play golf with him? Yes, sir. We'll get to that a little bit. Um, and let's talk about uh, your dad's side of the family. Was it a close-knit knit family? Yes, sir. Um, and, and your grandfather, your dad's father, his name was what? Handsome. Handsome. Um, that's his nickname. That was a nickname, I think. Yes, sir. It's what grandchildren called him. Everybody. Well, it started as grandchildren calling him, and then all of our friends started calling him that. But that, that was Randolph Murdoch? Yes, sir. And then uh, your grandmother's name, Libby? Yes, sir. And they lived close by, is that correct? That's right. Where do they live? Almeda. And in relation to, I guess, Hampton, where, where's Almeda? So straight down 278, like you're going to Yemisee. And how far away is it from, say, the law office of uh, PMPED to mm -hmm. your grandparents' house? Right. How, roughly how far is that? Ten minutes. Okay. And how far of a drive was it, would it have been from your house in Hampton? I mean, roughly the same. Right. And you know roughly how far of a drive would have been from? I mean, Buster the might not have cell. known that they probably bought more like twenty. The replacement if he's living with his girlfriend and living in school of, and not really worrying about what his little brother's doing, and, and he did, might not have known. It just seems odd. Did you and your mom and, and your dad and your brother Paul spend a lot of time with uh, the Murdoch side of the family? Yes, sir. And, and what would y'all do together? Um, this similar stuff, obviously, gathering during the holidays, various testimony. things like that. We would take trips with that side of the family as well, you know, get out everybody, rent a big house. Trying to make it harder you know, for the jury to believe this perfect family. The water on the weekends. Just but spend so much time together that he could do this. There's a lot of stuff this. going on with that side of the family as well. I don't know. I think so, that tactic um, worked better 20 years ago. Let's, let's go back and well, let's identify. On Jim, we have the internet. Side people have seen some shit, man. Brothers and sisters. Yes, sir. Who are they? John Marvin, uh, Randy, and Lynn. Okay. And then John Marvin, Randy, and Lynn had children, did they? Yes, sir. So he had a lot of cousins. We need the whole yes, family sir. tree. And the families would get together, those cousins and aunts and uncles. One That's of right. my cousins is getting married this year. And, and was there property excited. down on Chichesse? That it's been a while know? since I've been to a family it's been wedding. Time at yes, sir. That was the family river house, Chichesse. And where is that located? So it's located in Okatee. Um, I would like a family river house. Waters I'm Avenue. Put that out there to the universe. It's called Manifesting. Off the <laughs> Chichesse River. Right. It's, it's pretty pretty desolate. Sure. The um, in the some of this is leading of, in May and it's, June. It's of foundational and background. What was your not going to object to it? Grandfather Handsome's health condition as you knew it. Um, not not good. He wasn't in good health. What do you understand his health problems to be? Um, I understand he had cancer, and I understood that, you know, he was having a pretty big battle with it. And what was your grandmother? What what'd you call your grandmother? M. M. Yes, sir. What what health issues did she have in May and June of 2021? She has Alzheimer's. Okay. And would um would your dad frequently check on 
Handsome and M. Yes, sir. Would you, you would. go with your dad to check on Handsome and M? I would occasionally go with them too. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you really know and where he was going? What times of day would you? Because Miss Shelley's got a different go with story your dad to say. To check on your grandparents. It, it could have been any time. Um, went over at lunch a lot of times. Um, went over in the evenings a lot. Just no real set schedule. Just kind of cloak sword. Kind of I see you. I'd like to live in a village when, in Tuscany um, too. Would Would your mother go villa. with your dad? Sorry, she would. Rain. Not not regularly, but she she went. Would 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 Paul stop in and check on? Your yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Was that fairly regularly for something Paul to do? To yeah, Paul would do it regularly as well. Um, it looks like Alec is looking at the jury. When you would go with your dad in the evening to see how they're responding. Um, probably looking at well, Jim too. It's not limited to the evenings. What? Where would you park when you go visit your grandparents? Um, for the most part. Um, just like a ordinary afternoon visit, parking, you know, the, the garage, the um, carport. But if we went over a little bit later, then we would pull around to the back side of the house and be able to enter through the, the back door. Okay. And They're what, just what's trying to normalize. So when you walk in the back side, it's, it's like a, it, we call it a sunroom, but it's, you know, a, They're just trying a to dining table. It's got a TV in there. And then that is right next to the kitchen and then if you're in the kitchen and you go to the right then that's where my um, grandparents room is okay. Doug if you could pull up page 38 from states exhibit 524 please do it Doug Evans. 24 I believe it is they're looking for the overview from the summary because that's exhibit 524. They're looking for the overview exhibit of where the GPS on the truck was. They're yes. trying to connect the fact that the GPS on the truck wasn't anything that's nefarious. It was just regular practice. So, Buster, uh, this is from State's Exhibit 524, which is in evidence, which is the the uh, GPS data off the OnStar provided from General Motors and. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us uh, what's what's that house? So that's my grandparents' house at Almeida. All right. And these um, these Good dots job, in the back. Doug. And, and I'm going to Doug, you did the thing to uh, this line of dots just right next to the circle that, that Doug drew. Do you, do you see them where the, they seem to be connected right right here on the, the far right? Yes, sir. Where is that on, on the property? <clears throat> so that's right off the back corner of the house. Is that a place where you'd normally park to go in the back of the house? Yes, sir. That is where. And have you parked there yourself? I have. Have you seen other family members park there? I have. Is that is that a customary place to park? when you go in the back door where the kitchen sunroom is. Yes, sir. Okay. There was new information in that sentence, Jim. Um, something feels some icky about this. Yeah, I mean, Buster's photos. lost his whole family. His dad's in jail. HR his mom has been murdered. His brother has been murdered. The family legacy has crashed down. And here he is sitting on the stand being questioned. It's all uncomfortable. I think it's necessary for the defense. They're trying to build a better picture of the family. Um, and gain and empathy for Alec, but you if you it also feels really uncomfortable them, to watch. The jury, but just tell us what those <laughs> photographs are. Uh, just real, it just feels real uncomfortable to watch. And we'll see if he's confronted with things from the jail calls. I don't know if he will be or not. The prosecution should have listened to all of those that they had. Alec has been using different people's numbers to call out because when they so these photos calls, are do it by number. of the area we're talking about. So we don't know the if they have them all. Of the house in Almeida. All right. Your Honor, this time I move defendants exhibits 130 through 136 in evidence. Thank you. So it is. It does feel uncomfortable. So Doug, please pull up exhibit 133. And he, I mean, I see you guys in the chat talking about whether he's coached. He would have prepped with this team to testify. And Buster, tell us what 133 is, please. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so he this is the prepped. back door entrance to where I was just talking about to enter into the sunroom kitchen, into the kind of back quarters where my grandparents' bedrooms were. 
All right, and if you'll pull up 134, Doug, please. Doug's like, I'm trying. And what's 134? Same, same thing, same backside of the property, just a little bit of a different angle. So the, you can see the, the cars the house, out to the, to the right corner the there. What's that? You can see the cars over here. Can, can so you, can you see here? Yeah, so that right there would be my grandparents' bedroom. No, what he wants okay, to talk so about the cars, that's Buster. In the evening, your grandparents would be in that part of the house. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And if you went to the um, garage entrance, what what would what would happen? What what would be required of your grandparents or some sitter to let you in? Yeah, so you you, you could go and knock, but a lot of times they're in the back part of the house and they don't hear you. So you normally call and say like, "Hey, I'm I'm at the front. I need to be you know let in," and they'd have to walk from the back to the front, unlock the door, and let you in. But if you're in the back, how how far is the walk? Um, quarter of the distance it would be to walk to the it's very short and was it common to go in the back door yes sir and there uh, is no time and date stamp on the pictures that i saw and and then i'm sure the you, prosecution didn't ask please pull that up Doug. yeah i i know i know y'all with jim i know i do i do i know so is that the Donna, can, can he step down off the stand and point to the jury where did he just call him Alec? Not Buster. So Buster, step aside so that the jury can you're not blocking their view. I don't have a pointer, but can, can you point that was out? Odd. In the, it didn't sound like he in this photo. It sounded like he said Alec. Where you would normally it didn't park. sound like he said Buster. Uh, Right. He did just call him like, okay. Where you no, normally park to go into the. Um, so you would park, you know, right about. Thank y'all. Oh, don't put it in all right caps. Nightbot, the, Nightbot will swoop you. But yes, he did just same, call him Alec. Same stairway to go up to the back door. So you'd park in the grass. Yes, sir. And and near that um, satellite dish or not near what? the satellite dish? Yeah, Objection. Any, where would you park leading. in relation to the satellite dish? Yeah, right there close to it. All right. I don't know if I buy it. And that was. But then again, now, people around here park in the grass on, all the damn sorry. time. Uh, but it just looks like a what, very well managed property. Right <clears throat> that's um, that's what we call the cook shed. The and cook shed. Maybe there's. And what's in the cook shed? Uh, a couple couches, big TVs. That's mostly where my grandfather used to have a cookout on every third Thursday of a month and that's where he would have his little gathering. It's just a just an open open concept in there with a kitchen, TV, couple couches. All right. Hang on, Doug, you pull up one thirty two. Well Buster's huh. still standing here. I know. No tire marks, no mud. It doesn't look like people are regularly parking on the grass. I agree with you. It doesn't look like people are parking there at all. Lester, what's this uh, structure to the right of the, as you're looking at the cookhouse? Because that's, that's an old shed. Okay. Now, roughly, what's the distance between the cookhouse and the cook shed to where you'd normally park to go in the back door? You know. No, we don't know. You're testifying. 10, you 20 yards. You need maybe. to tell us. All right. Go ahead and take your seat, please. Nicole, have a safe flight to Mexico and a great trip. Enjoy the warm weather. I'm sure there's plenty in the chat that are staring down feet and feet of snow. We're jealous of the warm weather. Buster, how often would you speak with your mom and dad on the telephone on a daily basis? Jim shifted pretty cadence. much every day. I wonder if right. he's going to get into harder and, stuff. Um, and would um, would would you be with your dad when he's talking to your mother? Yes, sir. Um, I guess. I guess how, can you give the jury some sense of how frequently, as a family, y'all y'all would engage in telephone conversations daily? Yeah, it was very frequent. I mean, 
I, I spoke to my mom every day, m multiple times a day, and the like for my dad and and for my brother too. And then, and that's just me. And I know it's like they're all talking to each other too. Just a lot of a lot of conversating throughout the day over the telephones within the family. Okay. So, Doug, I want to He's pull just up sitting there going, what a lovely family. Even if you get acquitted for murdering them, the you still ruin Budowski, their life by stealing uh, from their clients and all the other ancillary fuckery. Extended, oh, thanks, B. Extensive timeline, not the condensed version. His son's testifying. Page 520, if you'll go to page 14, That's please. That's his friend. So, his, his like, Uncle Jim is cross-examining the son on the stand. It's the most awkward shit you've ever seen. What? Oh, I'm good. So, Buster, what I like to do, and this this starts at just at 1, 11, 10 p.m. If you can blow up that first entry, Doug. The, hey, uh, thanks, Doug, for blowing it up. That's super evidence, helpful. Offered by the state. And, Doug, and I just look how good go that looks. Some of these, again. Whatever program they're using to blow it up so is a at, nice at visual 110, effect. This document says, Paul Murdoch misses a phone call from Margaret Murdoch. And then at 1, 11, 36, it says, Maggie makes an outgoing call. Phone call Can to you Buster. just ask him why he Answer. wasn't at Moselle? That's minute, really what we want to know. Seconds long. Um, we really want to know. Do you have any independent recollection of this particular phone call? No, sir. Okay. Why weren't you at but, Moselle, but if son? You keep working your way down. Um, at 119, Doug, there's another entry. It says, Paul Murdoch makes an outgoing phone call to mom. Do you see that? For those of you asking, what does this have to at do with the case? It is setting yes, the stage of the family and, and, for the defense's argument that Alec couldn't have to, done this. That's what. Well, so I, I oh, guess no, that's, that's a not stop me. There, that's Doug. It? Doug Frequently is blowing it up. Your mother would reach out to you and, and Paul during the day. Yes, sir. Okay. I love it, though. And if, if you'll go down to 141, please, Doug, at 141, 33 seconds. Thanks, Doug. And you see uh, Maggie makes an outgoing phone call to Buster. Do you see that? At 142, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. And then right before that, at 141, it looks like Maggie makes an outgoing Phone call to Alex, not answered. Do you see that? Yes, How sir. would he know? And then if you go right below that, it says 142.43, Maggie makes an outgoing phone call to Paul. Now, you see that? Yes, sir. Well, anything and? unusual going on this day? Or is this sort of how life was in the Murdoch family? No, this this was this was normal. This was the... Oh, he's trying to establish that they're all on the phone all the time. Okay. And then if you'll go... They think the Page state's going to argue about the pills text Doug at the bottom that, that people were freaking out or there was some 50, kind of confrontation. One, 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 one fifty two thirty nine. And they're using PM. Buster to say this is a typical Says Maggie. Pattern. That makes sense. Murdoch makes outgoing phone call to Buster answered at one nineteen. So there's, here's another call from your mother. Is that right? Lauren yes, R makes a very good point. Not unusual, was it? Not unusual. Not unusual that they're Sorry, calling that, all the time. Page sixteen makes it more poignant when the phones uh, go silent, doesn't it? Fifty five. 40, if you'll take a look, blow that up, Doug. It says, Maggie Murdoch received the incoming phone call from PA Alec Murdoch. Answered six minutes and 18 seconds. And that was your dad and mom apparently talking, correct? Yes, sir. She clearly right called below that, Alec like 56, in 18, the phone. There's some instant Not messages PA. to you about pa. some medication. Do you, you remember what this might be about? Yeah, so this was about, I, um, I take a medication called Dupixent, which is a self-given shot. And I was up in Rock Hill and I needed to get the medicine delivered to this address here on the screen. Okay. And that's what we were talking about. She was, you know, calling the pharmacy to get it. Everybody's redirected. To your your mom address. was calling the Normal pharmacy day. for you. Does Doug, my mom call yes, the sir. pharmacy for me? Doug, if you go to page 19 at 324. I want my mom to call the pharmacy for PM. me. Excuse me, I'm sorry. 324. I promise you, 35. when my Alex kids are 20, I'm going to start making them make their own Buster. appointments. Maybe. 518 <laughs> seconds. Do you, sitting here today, do you remember what the phone call was about? Uh, no, sir. I don't know specifically what it's about. But just, just normal. Yeah, just. He's 26 now. Murdoch, That's right. Talking to his parents. Yes, sir. Some of you are like, my mom still calls the pharmacy for me. <laughs> no judgment, man. No judgment. It's just, you know, by the time I was a law student, my parents were like, good luck. 
Do you we'll be here to make dinner four? when uh, you want to come over for dinner. At 4.42.56 p.m. See, that looks like at 4.42, your mother's calling you again, right? Yes, sir. Anything unusual going on? No, sir. How does he know? Does he answer the call? Answer 38 and then seconds if you go to long. Page 26, Doug, at 5, 16, 25 p.m. And there's an entry that says Alec Murdoch calls Buster Murdoch. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Looks like a six second call. Do you remember what that might be about? Um, no, six seconds could be a, a butt dial. That, that would happen often. All right. And then um, if you go down the bottom of the page at 521, 11. They're trying to end round and cut off the like prosecution, a, arguing a that two second call, people were freaking out. That's which is about five about. minutes after what might have been the butt dial. But I think they're going through Alex this more Murdoch thoroughly. Receives a call, Buster, and it's 92 it. seconds long. You see that? Yes, sir. So are you returning your dad's call, you think? Probably. Okay. So I'm here for it. My dad butt dials me all the time. And I'm like, Dad! Dad! All right. Fine. And I'll just carry through. My dad has also activated, like, the emergency switch on his phone, like, trying to put a case well, off um, and on. No, I kept feel, sending the location to my brother. He's like, Dad, please stop sending 32. your location. At 6, 52, 13 p.m., please. This is just going through the timeline more thoroughly. Okay. Hold it up. Thank you. Oh, I like so this, the effect. This entry says Alec Murdoch calls Terry Brandstetter 412 seconds. I like whatever program the defense uh, is Terry using. Brandstetter? I like it. Papa T. I do. I like it. I and like the effect. Would your dad call your grandfather fairly regularly? Yes, sir. He would. So, again, anything unusual going on on the 7th for y'all to have all these communications? Well, that, I mean, no, it's sir. just speculation. It's, he, again, it goes both ways, though. The defense is arguing everything's normal. Um, and then everything's we'll fine. To... Everything's great. And then there's, you know, uh, the phone's going does. silent being such an important thing. It's just, it, it cuts both ways for them, too. And it says, Alec Murdoch, I messages Maggie Murdoch stating, quote, going to check on M, be right back, close quote. Now, who's M? Uh, my grandma. Wait, where does it say that? And this is at 908.58. And then at 910.47. Though I do like how big this says, is where we can see it. Alec Murdoch calls oh, there Buster. It, and it says 60 seconds long. Um, Doug's doing a great and, job. Thanks, Doug. And that's at 910.47 p.m. on June 7th. You remember getting that phone call? Yes, sir. What did you talk about? Objection. What did you talk about? Basis for the objection. I'll just react in here, sir. Pardon? I don't open the door to anything else. I'll react in here, sir. Yes, sir. Long lumber. I, I agree. What the topic was, John. I don't know. I don't know what program this is, but it's great. Um. Yeah. Don't say what your dad said. Just tell me what. Y'all talked about. Yeah, well, we just talked about, like, hey, how you doing? And then he said that he was going out to. Well, hang, well, hang on. Buster, that's still hearsay, my guy. Okay. I mean, I thought he didn't want to hear hearsay, but I'm sorry, Your Honor. Go ahead. Um, but he was just like, letting me know that fuck? he was going out to Alameda to check on them. Okay. And was this a unusual conversation you had with him? No, sir. What was his demeanor in the conversation? Normal. Had, had it changed from any of the other times you talked to him earlier in the day on the side? Normal, side? like Nation. when he was shot in the head on the side of the road, and normal like that? 911 call was Would he normal on occasion like call you when he was going to check on his mother, M? He would, yes, sir. Was that an unusual occurrence? No, probably one of the more regular occurrences. We Oh, Cindy Jackson, thank we, you. We all usually would probably make trial phone calls pad. Like riding in a car. So Thank you, Cindy. Over, 
Rob, Very look dominant. in the trial pad. It looks great. You take that down, Doug. So but I just do like um, what they're using. going through this extraction from say one o'clock until what we just talked about nine o'clock. We did well, either multiple phone calls within the family. Um, tell the jury about the cell phone coverage at Moselle. Um, not not great cell phone coverage. Didn't have a lot of service, especially around. And so again, if you were underneath the shed at the shed it had a metal roof it just couldn't get any service inside of it it was spotty around the whole property and it had honestly gotten bad up at the house we had just put on a new roof roof was metal and just kind of hindered a lot of the phone coverage yeah metal will do that there. the faraday bags what the it, defense is so fond of made being unusual metal. for um your dad to leave his phone at the house when he was going down to the shed no, sir. What? That's why he's testifying. So normal, like when he was stealing from clients. That, normal, like when he got, normal, like when he no, got sir. confronted. Would not be unusual. About well, did did your dad always have his phone with him when he was on the property at Moselle? Not all the time. That's not what his friend said, though. Um, did your brother always have the phone on him when he was at the property at Moselle? Not always on him. He he would have it near him, but you know he's out there working on stuff and didn't always have his phone just in his hand or in his pockets or anything like that. Did your father ever like misplace his phone? Yes, sir. Was that a frequent occurrence? It was. How about your brother? Was that, did he ever misplace his phone? He did. Was that frequent? It was. Really, Jim, his phone, his phone wasn't getting, his phone wasn't getting any service or any conversations for, just an hour right when murders happened now, because he lost it is testimony that, about Bubba. we're not doing that yes sir who's bubba bubba was our dog we will stand it's for no bubba, bubba slander he's a yellow lab and um jim is he difficult to control um he could be but for the most part no um <laughs> he would listen he would listen to dad more than anybody else but also we um we had a had a gun dog shot collar that we would put on him sometimes, and when he had that on, he was yeah okay on his p's and q's. The uh, okay switching gears on another topic. Uh, when your dad, I know everybody else has said Bubba's hard headed, oh, and he's like, oh, he's fine. He listens to dad How frequently. Would your dad? Take a shower or a bath. He could take him. He could take him a lot. And he, you know, working out there. If he goes outside and sweats a lot, comes back in and takes a shower. Was that normal routine for him? It was. And did um. So they're addressing the fact that. Yeah, it's it's hot out there in the summertime. Blanca. He's a lot bigger then than he is today. He was. That Blanca talked about the shower. Probably two, you know, six four, two fifty, two sixty. Right. He's like, I don't know how much my dad weighed, Jim. It's weird. Alan, I'm excuse me, Buster. Were you aware that your dad had a um, opioid addiction? Uh, a little bit. I knew a little bit about the usage of pills. What did you know about? It? I knew that I knew that either my brother and mom had found them at some point, and then you know, told him like, Hey, we found these. And he, I want to say the 2018 around Christmas, he went to a, a detox facility after Christmas. And that was my knowledge of it. Thought that that handled it. And then there were a couple more times after, after the fact where they would kind of go into this finding pills, all that stuff. And then he, he did a few, he did a few, kind of like at home, just self detoxed a couple of times from and, opioids, you know, thought, you know, once he did that, that, you know, get off of them. But that, that was kind of my general knowledge about it all. They found you, his you thought he, he had beat it. That's right. Yes, sir. And when he was confronted that was leading, with about Jim. pills, what was his attitude? I, I, I don't know. 
for sure because I wasn't there when a he lot wasn't of the a part of any of happened with, with them finding the pills. But maybe that's why Buster I mean, wasn't I've there never that heard night. Anything, just you know, apologetic and right. you know, sorry and would would usually be his kind of regular you know kind of response. How, how did your family handle disputes? disagreements um pretty i mean you know like adults pretty civilly you know you know talked about it stuff like that i mean and it just depends on the dispute you like right. you know like I, I was a kid you know i get spanked stuff like that once it's not really a disagreement that's just what you're a teenager it's just punishment. And college age right any reprimand or disputes you, you've gotten into with your father was it all civil yeah definitely civil um, your dad never yelled at you I, I i don't believe it at all with you and your brother yes sir he would was i don't believe this man never yelled family? no sir i just parents get upset i can't believe that in february he never ever yelled i just don't believe it at all voting accident is that correct Yes, sir. Um, oh. And I, I believe, where were you living at the time? Columbia. And and uh, he was just he settled that case. Eventually? Yes, sir. And what, and what type of uh, reaction was there to his involvement in the voting action and his criminal charges? Buster settled the civil, the community settled the civil case. I, I would say a negative reaction in family. the community. The, the media spike kind of got kind of got going after. You're it. blaming the there media. Was a lot of, a lot of articles in the media about you know our family and and stuff like that and uh, to your knowledge was paul being threatened or bullied on social media or anything like that yeah Bleeding. he was definitely being bullied and or on social media um you know just people sending random messages and i would talk to him i know a lot of times he'd be walking down the sidewalk and you know a car comes by and, and they would yell some stuff at him i knew he would go out, you know, in a bar and, you know, there's somebody that wants to talk about it and, you know, make a scuff about it, whatnot. Right. The, um, so people yelled from cars and at bars is what we're hearing. What was, um, yeah, people were, people were, uh, what was upset. your mother's reaction to all the negativity of surrounding the boating accident? It, um, you know, it kind of consumed her. She's, she's big on, on reading all of it. And when she read the negative stuff, it, you know, made her feel upset and whatnot. And it, it ultimately, it ultimately kind of caused her to distance herself from Hampton. Um, at this time, you know, primarily living at Moselle, she quit going to the to the grocery stores in Hampton. Quit going to the pharmacy. Quit going to get food in Hampton. Just thought that there was a, a real, you know, kind of a bad, kind of a bad vibe in Hampton. Like you go, she right. felt like people were staring at her and talking about her and stuff. Where, where would she do her shop? She moved over to Walterboro and started going over that way. Right. Were uh, Were you sued in the boating accident? Yes, sir. Um, no response. Yeah, why is it relevant? With regard to relevance, Your Honor, it's civil litigation about the boating accident has been a big part of the state's case. He's a party to litigation. Uh, overruled the objection. It's a fair argument. Were, were you sued? Yes, sir. Um, was your dad sued? He was. Was your mother sued? Uh, she, her estate became sued, but before she w was murdered, had she been sued? I don't know. I, I, I can't remember. Okay. Maybe. And do you know, do you know if Paul had been sued? No, I don't know that he had been sued. Okay. Well, I agree. Was your mother anxious you got, about Chad, I agree. Paul was pending yes, sir. criminal charges for boning under um, the influence and was still going was out to bars. Concern? Um, I agree. Her, I would say her biggest concern to stop was going out. reading articles after. Her biggest concern was the media. Know, Mark Tinsley had made a statement about how much money he was wanting to collect in the the negative press civil lawsuits, and I think it was to the tune of 
like forty million dollars or something like that. He was trying to trying to get and, and that, that made her anxious. And uh, what what was your reaction to statements like that? Um, well, I mean, I I knew what he was saying, but I mean, it's it's not to me. It just didn't seem, you know, I, I didn't think. Well, I don't have forty million dollars, so All right. And he doesn't know how to answer and, that. And was your dad anxious about the the lawsuit? To your knowledge, mm, he didn't appear to be overly anxious about it. Was he anxious about stealing from his clients? Because he didn't seem anxious about that either. The criminal case against Paul or the civil case? Uh, the criminal case. Right. And was, uh, did the family support Paul in the criminal matter? Yes, sir. Um, what do you mean by support? And what do you mean by that? I mean that supported him in his criminal case because, you know, amongst the family, none, none of us thought that he was driving the boat. We thought at, he'd been at the time of the, the accident. That's correct. Buster, I want to now talk. Uh, they think about the whole the family's being up to June the persecuted. 7th. Yes, sir. And, um, and and we showed the picture of the lake weekend that where you were um, went up to Kiwi with the Proctors and the Brandstetters. Yes, sir. And and then the following weekend, Thank I believe, you, was Memorial Day. Were you with your family on Memorial Day weekend? Yes, sir. And who who was present? Uh, a lot of people were present. I was there. My brother was there. My mom, my dad. I think the um, family believes. My brother had some friends. Their staying own with us. mythology and in this. Truly, I do. Those are people sleeping there, and then people are, you know, in and out throughout the day, throughout the weekend. I, mean, was I don't agree with family them. weekend. Yes, sir. Okay. It was a normal Memorial Day weekend at Edisto with your family and friends. That's right. Okay, I'm going to show you. Not this is not this. I'm going to show you Defendant's Exhibit 123, and I want to get you to identify it, Buster. Uh, don't just just say what it is. Uh, it's a picture of my mom and my dad and I on a boat. Is that Memorial Day weekend? Yes, sir. Your Honor, we move Defendant's Exhibit 123 in evidence. No objection. It's a different a boat? Is this the photo, Buster? Yes, sir. And then I, I believe this same weekend there was a, a birthday party or cookout. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, is this the happy um, birthday video with Chris Doug, Wilson you again? Could play exhibit um, defense exhibit sixty one, please. It's in evidence. Don't you take a look at that. Miha, you make a great point. This family is not used to responsibility. Oh, fucking hell. Dad? Yes, sir. And that was um. Well, that's all leading. Friends, when's your dad's birthday? Do you know the exact date? <clears throat> uh, it's not a test. You just say May twenty seventh. No, I know. I don't, I don't know the exact date. <laughs> it's around uh, Memorial Day. That's right. Twenty seventh, maybe. The um. Then the following I, weekend there I was a know my baseball birthday tournament in Columbia. Correct? Yep. Um, yes, sir. We all know your dad's Tell birthday at this about point. About that weekend, what what happened there? That was the weekend. Um, South Carolina was hosting a regional baseball tournament, and me, my mom, my dad, and my girlfriend went to the to the baseball games. And, oh, we're gonna get into the, the Krispy Columbia. Kremes. And it was a super regional or regional? A regional. Yes, sir. What's and, the difference between a super regional and, and a regional? And what, Help. What days that weekend did you go to the game? Saturday and Sunday. 
Did your mom and dad stay in Columbia that weekend? They did. Or they stayed on Saturday night? Yes, sir. Okay. And you, um, did you tailgate with them on Saturday or Sunday? Yes, sir. We did. Okay. And was it a normal weekend? It was. Fun weekend? Yes, sir. Um, and that Sunday would have been June the 6th. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And, um, and then on June the 7th, we, we went through a host of, um, number of telephone calls with, wait, you there was an explanation about regionals and, and super regionals leading up to 908, 910 on, on June 7th. Um, Thank you. War Eagle. Buster, when did you first find out that your mom and brother were murdered? Oh, my um my dad called me i can't i can't remember the exact time but it was later um and he called me on the phone he asked me if i was sitting down and i was like yeah and then he you know sounded odd and then he then he told me that that my mom and, and brother had been shot what'd you do well, Brooklyn, my girlfriend was with me and I, I think she heard the, um, she could hear my conversation kind of over the phone. And so she just started packing, packing stuff. And I, I kind of just sat there for a minute and I was, I was in shock, but eventually we got our stuff together and, and, um, drove down to Moselle. Do you remember what time you got to Moselle? It, it was it was early in the morning, late in the morning. Um, what what you know, if if we left around ten thirty eleven, got got there sometime probably around two o'clock in the morning. And when you got there, um, did you see your dad? Yes, sir. What kind of condition was he in? What was his demeanor? Yeah, his demeanor was. I mean, he was destroyed. He was heartbroken. I walked in the door and saw him and. Um, Gave did him a he, hug and did he ask just, you if you were safe? Just broken down. Could he speak? Not really. Was he crying? Yes, sir. Who who else was in the house? Do you remember? Yeah. Um my girlfriend Brooklyn and I got there. My out in the driveway, my Uncle Randy and Uncle John were out there. Chris Wilson and, and Corey Fleming had but just did gotten he there. Ask if they you were safe. behind us. And when I walked in um several of the partners were there ronnie crosby was there lee cope was there mark ball was there um, austin crosby was there william barnes uh my buddy nolan was there i have to say i appreciate his girlfriend and i'm I sure think i'm leaving some out, now response what I remember. to just start packing and that's you, how i respond to shit too how just, long you stayed there we're going stayed there several hours probably you know probably three or four hours till about four or five o'clock in the morning. And, and where did you go? Um, and then we left Moselle and we went to Almeida. When you say we, who are you talking about? Uh, my girlfriend, my dad, and my uncle John. Did y'all just go stay at Almeida? Did Miss Shelley have to house kind of everybody? Trivial. Um, but what was your dad wearing when you first saw him? Shorts, t-shirt. And um, did you help him pack? I, I did, yes, sir. What did you do to help him pack? Got his bag and went into the closet, oh, grabbed some t-shirts, grabbed some shorts, shirt. grabbed a um, toilet kit. Okay. Put in the bag and, and left. Why were you doing the packing? Uh, just trying to help him. He, you know, he was so upset. We were all upset. That's what you do. Just trying to expedite the process of getting out me to when when you went in to pack your your dad was there a t-shirt laying on the floor i, I couldn't Bleeding. remember um did you get shirts from above the um i don't know where did you get t-shirts from got them from the closet and there's like a wooden it's like wooden shelves up on the wall and i was getting the t-shirts from there were there a lot of t-shirts on the shelf? Yes, sir. Do you know whether or not one of the t-shirts fell on the floor when you're packing? 
I don't know whether one of them fell on the floor or not. But the form of the question. I mean, certainly could have happened. And that's the point. Uh, Gerda in the chat said, why was he allowed to stay in the courtroom throughout the trial and the testimony? There was no exclusionary order. When you um, Most of the witnesses were in the courtroom off and on. Got to Moselle. Uh, Weird as it is. Were you able to get some sleep? No, sir. Did you um, go back to Moselle the next morning? Yes, sir. Um, and who went with you? Um, me, uh, my girlfriend, Brooklyn, and my dad. And maybe John Marvin. I don't know if he was riding with us or, or already out there separately, but he was somewhere in the mix. Do you remember roughly what time you got to Moselle? I mean, uh, I think we got there rather early. You know, nobody really slept. And yeah, When did you eat? Early in the morning, sun comes up. Just did um, go back up. Did did you take a shower in Brooklyn? Take a shower at Almeda, or did you do it over at Moselle? No, sir. We um, we slept at well, tried to sleep at Almeda, and then we took everything back with us to Moselle, and, and we showered there. That's odd. You know where your dad took a shower that morning? Ah, uh, yeah, Moselle. I've got questions. And when you went back over um, in the morning, do you know what your dad was wearing? When you were traveling from know. Almeda? Back no, not specifically, but I know that, you know. I'm going to ask I know Nicole, what I packed, is so showering at Moselle odd for you when they're and staying and elsewhere? Stuff. And after um, you got to Moselle, and I, I guess just carrying the days forward, um, were you with your dad? Well, how often were you with your dad once you got back to Moselle on, on the 8th? Every day. Um, for how many days? For a good while. Okay, so let's talk about where you stayed on the night of the 8th. Do you remember? Night of the 8th would have either stayed back at Almeda or that's that's potentially when we made the transition over to John Marvin's um, hunting lodge. Well, were you, um, would you say we, are you including your father? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you drive together? Yes, sir. And did, was he pretty much in your eyesight? for the first few days? Yes, sir. And so I, after um, the 8th, and then you come up on the 9th of Wednesday, uh, do you know whether you were at um, Mita or spending the night at at your Uncle John Marvin's place? Yeah, I think at that point we had switched over to his place over at Greenfield. Now, and you call it Greenfield. That's the name of the, his hunting place. Um, Yes, sir. Just the name of the I'm going to start naming my rooms of my house. How so far it feels is it like from, I have different properties Alameda? named uh, to Greenfield? Yeah. A couple minutes. I mean, not close very, by, close yeah, by. right down the road. And then. And and do you remember how long you stayed at, at Greenfield with your dad? Yeah, I mean, several days. And, you know, I think anywhere from the 9th to the, you know, probably that rest of that week through that weekend. Yeah, on um, Thursday, June 10th, what happened? Um, grandfather died. So the family was together and stayed together? Yes, sir. It does conflict, but we don't you ever have remember good your dad disappearing time. for any periods of time. No, sir. On when were you close, physically close to him most all the time? Yes, sir. We don't Except have good time right. um, for when Blanca came back the next day. Like, I'm still not clear on the timeline. Oh, yeah. I'll start calling the office the Rainbow Room. I'm here for it. And I believe the funeral for your mom and brother memorial service was on that Saturday. Yes, sir. And then that. Sunday was a funeral for your your father? 
grandfather. Grandfather, sure. yes, sir. Shelly did talk about them staying at Omida and, a little, um, but I would need to go back and remember. I don't remember. At some point in time, you went to. At, did you go to Somerville at some point in time? Yes, sir. Uh, do you remember when you went to Somerville? Um, Blanca would have mentioned the towels. Right, right, you know, beginning of that next week. Okay. I'm going to show you uh, what I've. And we know this family's not cleaning and stuff Mark up. Is, That's been well established. 129 and um, ask you. And I understand why Blanca went to go clean up. I get it. Everybody's going to be coming to the house. They want it put in order. I understand that. But that is an excellent point, Chad. This is why Chad is bay because we all have more so memories than just me. Yes, sir, you're, you're, I'm not introducing 129 and offering it. To the witness to refresh his recollection. He didn't say he needed his recollection reflect refreshed. Uh -huh. Um but it's for ID. Um, but Blanca didn't mention any other towels. Publish that, but but I want you to hey um I, I want to ask you if that defendant's exhibit one twenty nine mark for identification purposes refreshes your recollection as to when you left to go to Somerville. Yes sir. I went and well tell the jury what what is that? What's that document you have in your hand? It's a it's a text thread between my girlfriend and I. And and does it have so based on that text communication between you and your girlfriend, it refreshes your recollection. When did you leave to go to Somerville? June 14th. And looking through there, refreshing your recollection. How long did you stay in Somerville? Stayed in Somerville until Yes, people can refresh their recollection. They can through it. Stayed in Somerville until the 17th. And then what do you remember doing after you left Somerville? Um, on the 17th, we left Somerville to go to Lake Kiwi. And so when you were in Somerville from the 14th to the 17th, who, who were you staying with? Staying with my grandparents. Which grandparents? The Brandstetters? I'm guessing. And then uh, you went to Kiwi. Who did you go with? Sounds with like a lot of leaving I, the house. My grandparents, my aunt and uncle, and and their their children, their children's boyfriends, and that was it. Everybody. It so was literally you're with everybody. your dad from the night of June seventh and through the Kiwi trip. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you remember what you did after the Kiwi? Was there Miss Shelley testified to them coming in and moving no. cars around and stuff? They haven't talked about any time, of that. You just said, you know, I've got to go back to Rock Hill. Yeah. Yes, sir. Remember roughly when that was? No, I, I mean, I think it was sometime following all this, but I couldn't. I can't tell you exactly when I went back to work. Um, when you decided to go back. To Rock Hill, it's you, had, very, you had a job in Charlotte. Their hair is very red, yes, but they have, I think, redheads on both sides of their family. Do you have any it's a lot of redheads in this your trial. Father, about but your it is, personal safety. It is great. Yes, sir. I have a friend did, that was at Did red. he make any offers to you? He did. What offers did he make to you? He offered me to. What's the objection? Basis for the objection. Hearsay. Self serving hearsay. Your know, offer is not hearsay. Offer. The objection sustained. <laughs> Jim's face. He was like, Fuck. "Did um? Why is the offer not hearsay, though? That's what Jim did not explain. Did you take any security precautions? No, no. Did you want any security protection? No, sir. I didn't. Why not? Well. I, I didn't I didn't want to carry a, a gun or anything like that. And I also didn't want uh, like a private security detail following me around just for lack of privacy. And and at the time, the, the places that I that I was staying in the places that I were going, um, like I was staying at Rock Hill in my girlfriend's house who has. You know. No, we don't know. Alarm systems and security cameras and whatnot. And then other than that, I'm staying in hotels, which, right. you know, I just felt. 
you felt like your life wasn't it. at risk. Some he point says, time, you know, you the same way father, his dad uh, does. His dad says, our, you know. Reward. Yes, sir. Um, I'm sure you would have marked his defendant's exhibit. So he wasn't scared. Asked if he identified this. He can identify this. Yeah, yes, sir. This is the reward. Esther said, yes, sir. My dad is as red as Buster. Reward. His yes, nickname sir. is Red. Your Honor, we've moved. To the they did call Alec like Big Red. No objection. It's admitted without objection. Um, and Cleo in the chat is talking about the Scottish descent. I believe the Murdochs pronounced their last name in the Scottish way, or at least that is what the chat has told me, because we have a delightfully international chat. Some of y'all are horrified out. about our jury system. You're like, wait, just people? There's just people sitting there that pull out the top two paragraphs. This is a word document. How do I know you didn't type this? Okay. What in the fuck is that? Uh, How is that evidence? What? Did, did you work on this language with your dad? Yes, sir. Ah. And um, can you read to the jury the first two paragraphs, please? Ah. Beginning with Alex and Buster Murdoch. Yes, sir. Alec and Buster Murdoch announced today a reward of 100000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons who brutally murdered Paul and Maggie on June 7, 2021. I want to thank everyone for the incredible love and support that we have received over the last few weeks. <clears throat> now is the time to bring justice God. for Maggie and Paul. Buster and I, along with Maggie's mother, father, and our entire family, ask that anyone with helpful information immediately call the SLED tip line or crime support. Where was it published? Sorry, though? Crime Stoppers. Thank you. I'm sure it was published somewhere. Now there's a um, people talked about the reward the body being offered of this, by the law a firm. Expiration date on this reward. What's what's your understanding of the purpose of having an expiration date? That might lack foundation. Um, I'm I'm not real sure. Oh, there we go. That answers the question. Well, you see, it says to be eligible, the person claiming the reward. Jim. There's Must no foundation. Must submit the tip to Sled or Crime Stoppers by September 31, 2021? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. But for Alec, offering money that he didn't have, if he's not confident anyone's going to pull in the tip, it cuts both ways. I don't know what offering a reward what? says to anyone. What happened in, in September, early September, 2021, Buster? Um, talking about the... Yeah, do, do you remember? That would be leading, dad, Buster. What yes, happened in detox, September? Roshad shooting. Yes, sir. All leading. Um, Why do you mean, what from, are you talking that about? Moment that well, you've been sitting here for four weeks, went Buster. And went to detox. Did... He ever come back <gasps> home to his property, his clothes, his belongings? No, to your sir. Knowledge? No, sir. There's been some questions about whereabouts of whereabouts are <clears throat> Alex clothes. He tell the jury before he went off to detox what? where his clothes were, how many different locations he had what? clothes. What? Um, That's all leading. So had clothes at Moselle, had clothes at Greenfield, had clothes at probably a few clothes at Almeida, had clothes at Randy and Christie's house. So he could have changed had, anywhere. Had clothes, a lot of yeah. places. You have clothes down at Chichesse uh, or? Yep, yep, Chichesse, Okatee. You have clothes All at Edsta. Yes, sir. You have clothes in his car. Yes, sir. Okay. Can't leave the witness. This How is getting to. after. June seventh. Blanca said so she never saw the clothes again. At Moselle? None. I mean, nights after June seventh, did you spend at Moselle? None. This goes to Blanca saying, "I never saw those clothes again." That's why he asked about the clothes. His clothes are everywhere. Well, they they gave Paul a hard time for his shit being everywhere. I'm gonna um. Do you have the Snapchat video? Can you pull that up, please? Of, of the tree. Your Honor, this is the Snapchat video that's in evidence. I'll get the exhibit number for the record shortly. The record doesn't recognize it as the tree video, and that is a problem for the record. <laughs> um, 
Uh, Buster, you recognize that shirt? Uh, yes, sir. What kind of shirt is it? It's like a, you know, short sleeve button down shirt. Is it a Columbia shirt? Leading. No, it doesn't look like a Columbia shirt. What color is it? It's blue. Um, did your dad have a foam green Columbia sports shirt? Um, may maybe. Okay. Is this it? No, this is blue. Did um. Do you, do you know if your dad ever ordered any Vinny Vine or I don't know? Did he order? <laughs> did he order clothes? It's already leading. Um, after your mother and brothers. Murders. Maybe he ordered clothes, but he he doesn't wear a lot of vineyard vines. Okay. Have you ever seen him buy vineyard vine? No, sir. And um, this is still direct examination. You can take that down, Doug. Also. There's 43,000 of you here. Hi, welcome to the Law Nerds, for those of you that are new. Um, Come join the chat. It's nice. Sometime in August, did did you uh, go with your dad where you, you played in a golf tournament? Yes, sir. I went played in a golf tournament, and he came and wanted to watch us play in it. And what kind of golf tournament? It's a, it's a golf tournament that a buddy of mine puts on in Somerville every year. It's called the... Jasso Invitational. It's just a bunch of guys that are friends come together and play in a golf tournament. I love that they and, and announced it as an invitational for his tournament before for his buddies to play. I did. And what date was what weekend was that tournament in August of excuse me in 2021? Yeah, it's the last weekend in August of 2021. Okay. I like that they call it an invitational. I need to start naming shit so um, it seems more important. Do, do you know if you, you were in the making shirts for well, it? Was there a house? Uh, he doesn't Johnny know how Parker to ask the question without leading. Kept stuff in. Yes, sir. There's a um, there's a small house in between Johnny Parker's house and my uncle Randy's house. It's I think I think Mr. Johnny built it for his mom or or, or mother in law or something when she was sick. But yeah, there's a little little two bedroom house right there. And did your dad stay there? Some? He did. He did. I don't know if we mentioned that as one of the places where there was clothing. Yeah, that'd be one. That'd okay. be another one. <sighs> All right. So there are a lot of places. Yes, did, sir. Uh, were you were you there? Um, did you observe your dad talking to Blanca about anything? Uh, were you getting ready to go on the golf trip? No, sir. Okay. You were not present? No, sir. I don't think I was present. Oh, for the talk about the shirts. Were, did you go in any other golfing outings? Um, in August with your dad, to your knowledge. Um, yes, uh, earlier in er, earlier August of that year, we played um, played golf down in Hilton Head with the people from the Trial Lawyers Convention. Okay. Because nothing says trial lawyers now like golf, um, and that's not me being sarcastic. That's just fact. You've been sitting in this courtroom every day since. Day one, yes, sir. Once every the trial day. started every day, and um, you were were you here when so um, weird a video me. was played of an interview with your dad on June tenth? Yes, so sir. So weird. Um, and there was a question is about whether your dad said I did him so bad or oh. did him so bad. You remember yeah. that? Good question. Yes, sir. Um, do you recognize your dad's voice? I do. If you listen to it, would you be able to tell the jury whether it's I or they? Yes, sir. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to pull up Exhibit 153, the clip. So yeah. he's going to say they, they, they did them so bad. They did them so bad. They did so bad. What did your dad say? He said they did them so bad. They did them so bad. So that's the they first time you heard him say they did them so bad? No, sir. When was the first time you heard him say they did them so bad? Uh, first time I heard him say that was the night that I went down to Moselle, the night of June the 7th. 
Did he say that more than one time? He did. It's all leading. One second, Your Honor. Let me check to see what I left out. Can somebody ask Buster what shit you up, up means? Because I just, I have questions. The jury's going to determine what they hear. They've got two competing things on what they said, and the jury's going to get to decide. So that actually is just not hearsay. Me, um, They're going to get to decide. Buster, you've heard testimony during this trial of, that your dad was oh, no. stealing Oh, no, it was self-serving hearsay from, from up at the kennels. Yes, You're right. anything about that. No, sir. Sure. You're right, Jack. And... Um, just lastly, uh, roughly how long would it take to clean a, a dog run down at the kennels? Two dog runs, for example. I don't know. Um, I never did it. <laughs> roughly, I'd say 10 minutes or so. Okay. And what do you have to do? You got to get the hose, turn the hose on, spray out spray out the dog kennels. You got to you know, put the bed on top of the wooden box so the bed's not wet. Um, now, you're, what are you spraying? Dog manure? Yeah, spraying you know, dog poop. And it spreads out, and you've got to. That's right. Yeah, you got to spray it. Make sure it's all out of there. Spray it to the back. Oh, all right. Um, yeah, you. it's That's all, all it's all kind of leading. But again, the prosecution hasn't really. We'll take a break now, ladies and gentlemen. Not been about late. fifteen oh, minutes. Thank Please God. go to the jury room. Please do not discuss the case. And we are on a fifteen-minute break from court. With that. Okay, let's answer some questions. I don't know if that helped. Um, I don't know if that testimony moved the needle for anybody. I don't know if it answered any of your questions. We're going to end the poll that we have going on right now, and I'm going to ask if that if that testimony answered any of your questions. We're going to do a next poll. So we're going to end this poll and then ask another poll um, and see if that testimony... Let me see. Let me phrase it. I'm going to, Miguelina, I'll type it in because I'm I'm phrasing it as I go. And I've got the chat up like a professional today. We're like actually a streamer. Um, uh, let's see. The judge is now leaving the bench. Answer. Did that testimony answer any questions for you? S some of you might be left with more questions. That would be a no. So did that testimony answer more questions for you? Why is the defense allowed to lead so much? The prosecution did it too. Both sides have led to high fucking hell. Both parties. The prosecution did a ton of leading questions, and so did the defense. No one's objecting to it. That's why it's allowed. It's it's in proper form. But you could almost see Jim struggling either because he doesn't want to be cross exam or he doesn't want to see he doesn't want to be doing the examination of Buster or because he's struggling to ask non leading questions of Buster, who's like what, huh? And he's trying to get the leading question assumes the answer kind of in the question. Did your dad ever order any Vinny Vines shirts? He, he wants him to talk about the Vinny Vine shirts versus did your dad purchase any clothes after August, whatever the date was. And so it sounded like he was struggling to reform those questions because Buster seemed to not quite know what his answers were at times. And that could be due to trauma. It could be because he doesn't remember. It could be because he doesn't know the things he's being asked about and saying, I don't know, is not going to necessarily work. So it depends on how cynical you are um, with how you feel that went or how you feel they prepped that. So it just depends. Um, that was that was very interesting to see. All right, let's go ahead and answer some questions. LOL, my phone says four people in chat. That's fantastic. It left off the rest of it, 43,000. Why do they need a break after 45 minutes? Um, the judge determined that the, the, the jury needed a break. So that's what it is. Um, all right. Jess said, just want to thank you for your commentary about Honey Badger. You're welcome. I love that video so much. I gave my daughter's soccer teammate the nickname. It made me happy to see someone else talk about it. I love, I love the Honey Badger video. Last night on our members only live stream, we did a little bit of a walk down a uh, YouTube memory lane amongst reading some books. Um, so that was a lot of fun on our members only live stream last night. Cindy Lonard, thank you so much for the super chat. Emily, I've been mulling over this question all weekend. Do you think the defense, AKA our boy Poot will try to use the new Netflix documentary that is coming out Wednesday to declare a mistrial? Do you think that will come up at all? Discuss. We saw the defense argue about these things during the Jen Shaw case when stuff comes out in the middle of trial. I don't think the timing is 
great. I think HBO or Netflix, sorry, Netflix, isn't thinking about potential impact in the trial. We saw social media come into this case this morning with the judge saying, look, I got onto Twitter. I love that the judge has a Twitter. I, I Twitter has a lot of ads on it all of a sudden. Um, saying, I got onto Twitter and... Um, and this was the first thing I saw, and we're not friends on Twitter, Jim. So it was very interesting to see that um, the, even the judge is noticing and commenting on the trial publicity. So will the defense bring it up? Possibly. Possibly. Um, but they already know in advance that it's coming, so could they have brought it up already? Maybe. And my, why did my my mouse just disconnected from my computer? Well, that's difficult. Um, I can't pull up any other questions on the screen. So give me one second. Hopefully this will reconnect. It didn't give me a low battery notification. Hold on. We're going to have to, we're going to have to plug it back into something because it seems like my mouse is dead. That's not professional streamers here. People we're, prof I can't even play the WAP because I can't use my mouse. Migalina, can you play our WAP bumper? Because, um, I need to plug this in real quick because otherwise I literally can't run my stream at all. So if you don't mind running that bumper real quick, I would sure appreciate it because uh, I got I got nothing. I am. Thank you. I have to find my power. I am just, we are dead in the water without this mouse. Thanks for the low battery notification, Apple. Super helpful. Couldn't be more thrilled. Okay, we're back. <laughs> that was delightful. So trying to plug in my mouse so I could actually, you know, run a stream. Um, unplugged my internet because that's delightful. Miguelina, do you mind taking this super chat down so we can go to the next one and go to the next one? I appreciate it. Oh, wait, we didn't discuss. Sorry. Sorry, we didn't discuss. All right. Oh, I'm back. We're back. We're back in action. Awesome. So yes, I think they might bring it up, but they should have already brought it up. They could have brought it up this morning. Y'all, chat, we're just, where's the fan? Ugh. We're just, we're just, it's a whole thing. It's just a whole thing. Um, Angela said, this feels so disjointed. It is. Tech issues are always disjointed AF. It absolutely gets unhinged, but that's the fun of streaming. That is absolutely the fun of streaming. Oh my God, she's just like me. Natalie, we yes, girl. <laughs> um, tech, tech happens. Tech happens. Tech happens, especially when you're doing as much coverage as we do during a trial. So um, that's where we're at. Anyway, there's 43,000 in the chat. This is the slowest. Yep, this is, the, this is slow mode. So anyone asking for the chat to slow more, it's not going to slow much more. All right, let's see. Bree, thank you for the for the grace this morning. We are definitely trying to be, you know, we're always here before court starts. Or at least we have been for this trial. I was having tech withdrawals or trial withdrawals. Courtney, fair enough. I did, um, let's see, how many hours did I do yesterday? Because I recorded the podcast yesterday and then we did the members only live. It was like, it was like four hours. What time did I start? Um, yeah, it was like four hours of of streaming yesterday across all the things that we did. This week's podcast episode, we're just going to take a minute. We're just going to take a minute. If you guys don't listen to the Emily Show podcast or, or you are new to finding me, this week's podcast is unhinged. I'm going to tell you a secret. Somebody else is going to cover this before my podcast goes live tomorrow, but I'm going to tell you a secret. 
because I don't think people have caught this yet. So in the Idaho case, we're going to we're going to talk about the Idaho case for just a second while we're on a break. In the Idaho case, you know, the Idaho quadruple homicide, there is a ancillary defamation case from a TikToker who's been talked about by Marquis and Inabber and Atuzi and others who determined through their spiritual witnessing that the uh, one of the college professors was in fact the murderer, not not Brian Koberger, who's been arrested. And again, Brian Koberger hasn't been been found guilty. He hasn't gone to trial. He's presumed innocent. But the TikToker decided that he, that the college professor was having an affair with one of the victims and then ordered a hit on them and had them killed. The college professor sent multiple cease and desist. The cease and desists, the cease and desist went to. Uh, went to content purposes. They were content fodder. So then filed a defamation lawsuit as one does. The the TikToker has now sued, sued, or is trying to sue the college professor. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. The TikToker is trying to counterclaim the college professor. The TikToker is trying to sue the college professor. Suing the college professor. Suing. The TikToker was sued and is now suing. That is what's happening. Yep. So for all of you in the chat going, wait, what? Yes, that. Yes, that. Also, a default judgment was entered. So we go through all of that in tomorrow's in tomorrow's podcast. So, um, also, yes, I did see, since we're, we're covering other stuff and then I'll be, oh, she's suing for defamation. She's suing for defamation. She's suing the lawyers and the professor for defamation for saying that her statements are defamatory. It has caused her great distress that they said that her statements were not true. Um, and she called out a lot of media organizations, a whole bunch of, of YouTube channels. Mine was not included it felt delightfully refreshing to not be to not be included for once but she didn't include a Tuzi either she did include Inabber Marquis and others some of the videos they link in the lawsuit are down some of them are up um and she's also trying to sue them for criminal obstruction of justice which you can't do in a uh which they can't do in a civil suit so that's happening. So that's tomorrow's. That's tomorrow's. Oh, oh, did I mention she's representing herself? So there's that. There's that. It's um it's interesting. Very, very interesting. So uh with that, that's coverage tomorrow. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. I, I left out the punchline. I'm sorry, I left out the punchline. I left out the punchline. She uh she is representing herself. So in a civil case, there is not going to be anyone to come bail her out. Apparently, she's in another civil case. I haven't researched that one yet, but this is a whole ass mess. But talking about defamation for tomorrow's podcast and and wild claims is is a different uh a different shift for us. So let's get to uh let's get back to the questions on this case. I should swoop a dupe that too. Swoop a doop. Can the prosecution call new witnesses in rebuttal? Yes, they can. Much like the spicy Draco moment in the uh with Morgan Tremaine in the Depp Heard trial. Ooh, my coffee has stuck in my throat oddly. Much like that, you can call new witnesses in rebuttal. And uh, they probably will call new witnesses in rebuttal. Courtney said, I was on a homicide jury last week. <clears throat> Went faster than this case. I want to thank you. Everything you taught me made me a better juror. I'm glad that you felt able to participate in the process that is so important to our system of justice. Courtney, thank you for that feedback. I really appreciate that. Kylie said, good morning from Daytona. Coffee and definitely cursy words getting these kids off to school this morning. I'm Or Dayton, Ohio, not Daytona. It would be much warmer in Daytona, in Dayton, Ohio. Are y'all getting all this? Ohio's going through all this stuff. So we are thinking of you, Ohio. 
Lisa said, I'm so bummed. I did not get any notifications anymore. Lisa, I wanted to talk about this. I had a conversation about YouTube notifications this weekend. If you have notifications turned on for the channel, they need to be to all for them to be delivered consistently. So if you don't like the notifications that you have, unclick the bell, re-click the bell and go to all. The most reliable notification system I am told is that if when I populate the live stream, if you go to notify me, those notifications are fairly reliable and consistent. So when you see the live stream populate on the channel, go to notify me. We are going to be rolling out shortly. Um, we are working on multiple options to notify the international crew and everybody because the text crew doesn't reach our international audience. And for those of you interested in trial coverage, that can be frustrating. We are looking at some other solutions, including like a Monday scheduling email where you will get like, these are the live streams this week. And then a Friday roundup, like this is all the coverage and this is where it lives. So you just get two and they tell you where the things are. So you can always find the links that you're looking for and know when to expect me, um, particularly for the weeks when we change. But I am normally live on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central. So that's normally how that goes. But if you um, if you hit that notify me on the live, it will, not it will notify you. And that seemed to work very well for y'all today. So let me know if that works. And, and we will know. Um, thank you for all of you that sent me the Jim Griffin stuff. I saw it. I appreciate you. Thank you for tagging me in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's see. Um, Emily, your trial of Depp Heard got me through bar prep. Yay. I'm convinced you helped me pass. Cheers. You learned lots. Watching Depp Heard is a very good bar prep. You learned lots watching that trial. So I'm glad that it helped. Congratulations on passing the bar. And now you get me through my day-to-day. -day. It's an interesting day-to-day -day as an attorney, but congratulations on passing the bar, um, Melly Esquire. So congratulations to you. Let us continue on. Ellie said, or L, apologies. Thank you for, so much for streaming this trial. Your trial streams help me study. And I'm in the middle of some exams to qualify for grad school. I'm here to help you study. I'm here to be your voice in the background. So many of you are just like, hey, you just come to work with me. I'm here to come to work with you. That's why we try to do new new content Tuesday through Friday now. Um, Michelle said motion for DEF CON Red. The Twitter fuckery was definitely fuckery. Penelope Slane, how is it okay that Tinsley paid a witness $1,000 via a social media program, but Jim Griffin retweeting is a problem? It's not okay that Tinsley, um, I don't think it's okay that Tinsley, uh, <laughs> that Tinsley made a donation to a GoFundMe in the middle of trial. I didn't think that was okay. And Jim Griffin retweeting is more of a problem because Jim Griffin is an active litigant. So he is governed by different rules being the attorney in the case. So for the court, Penelope, because I think that's what you're asking about, why the court was like, well, what did Tinsley do wrong? And the court's like, Jim, this is not okay. The rules of professional conduct cover pretrial and during case publicity. And so there's concern from the public, it seems, that this crosses the line. And it they never said, notice the court never said that the prosecution brought it to their attention. The prosecutors didn't complain about this. The public emailed the court about this and was like, uh, your honor, what the fuckery is this happening? And that's a very interesting thing. Um, Sarah asked, what did I miss? I'm sure the court will get to it. Jim did more than retreat. He commented by post by pasting the article title in the text section. When he did it, the article title is below his comment is at the top. I think that is a quote tweet. Viewer's voice, good to see you, Nick. I wonder what temp the thermostat is set to behind him. We have heard that this courtroom is chilly AF. We have heard it is very cold. Um, LK said, I feel sorry for him no matter what. It's horrific losing someone to murder chart. Murder changes you forever. I agree with you. And it's, look, for all of us, we're law nerds. We're capable of complex thought most of the time. Sometimes it's harder when I'm streaming. But we're capable of complex thought. Like two things can be true at once. You can feel for Buster and feel for the circumstance that he is in and still have questions about what happened with Stephen Smith and still have questions about, you know, the propriety of giving his license to Paul. And that's part of why he was sued in the death of Mallory Beach. It can be both. You can be like, I have empathy for this circumstance because this circumstance sucks. Having to testify your dad's murder trial when he's accused of killing your mom and brother 
is a really fucked up circumstance, but it doesn't, it, your empathy for that circumstance doesn't excuse or forgive other things. And you both can be true at once. We are, we are very capable of complex thought. Um, Deborah said, stop talking over the testimony. Nope. Uh, sure not going to do that. So you are welcome. There are plenty of channels that stream without commentary. News 19 WLTX is streaming without commentary. Um, Court TV streams without commentary. Law and Crime does have some commentary, but you're welcome to do all of the things. But I give commentary. That's what I do here. Buster may be compartmentalizing. It's also fair. It's also fair. Angela said, EDB, my favorite court caster. <laughs> Watching it work, sustaining and overruling objections. Love the laundered community. I love this community too. So Jim is rattled because of Twitter. Not that Karen, he might've been, but he might've just been like, and the judge is like, the judge basically said the ethical board should really consider what social media plays when the lawyers are actively engaged in a case. This came this came up in the Girardi case where um, there was a there's an individual who's quite active on Twitter that became the special prosecutor for one of the bankruptcy custodians and was commenting, and it came up to the court, and the court was like. Lawyers are allowed to talk. This doesn't raise to the level of improper pretrial publicity. Lawyers are still allowed to give comment. So there's a balance here that law is going, excuse me, going to have to figure out. I make that less complex. If I've ever consulted on a case, I don't give commentary on that case. If Rogan Gibson can keep it together, Buster is going to be just fine. I'm not quite sure what that goes to, but okay. Um, Laura's like, I'm awake. What the fuck? This morning has been a lot. I missed what happened with the tweet issue and what the judge said about it. The judge kind of said, mm. he said that the rules of professional conduct are silent, but he's heard a lot about it and maybe don't comment on the active case. And Jim said he wouldn't. No other action will be taken on that. It's been noted for the record. SB said, I wish I had, I wish they had protected him and kept him off the stand. This feels icky. Um, criminal trials feel icky a lot. And the point of the trial is to get a jury to come back with a not guilty verdict for the defense. And even if it feels icky to have Buster on the stand, they need to have Buster on the stand. It brings empathy, but it also explains Alec's behavior to get away from Alec having to get on the stand and testify. Oh yeah, the family was always texting like this. Nobody was like freaking out. That cuts both ways. Oh yeah, he had clothes everywhere. So it's not like it's super sus that um, Blanca didn't see those clothes again. They used Buster to answer those questions. The um, the I Love Cursey Words mug is on the Lawnard shop at lawnardshop.com. That's where that is. So lawnardshop.com is, I think I can put this, let's see. I used to have a little bottom uh, flag where I could put that up, but I think I took it down because I never used it. They bring the jury. Bring the jury. So lawnardshop.com is where all that is. How did Sled rule Buster out of the murders? No idea. No idea how they did. Emily said, how old is too old to go back to law school? It's all a matter of debt and figuring out how much it'll cost and how much you'll pay it back. If you figure out the financial bit of law school or go to a regional law school that is not ridiculously expensive, it's never too late to learn new things. Will the prosecution ask about the cheating in law school? The, the plagiarism in law school, I don't know. If they will ask if he got kicked out of Nashville, uh, kicked out of law school. I was already starting to read this question and my brain already started processing it. Lady Fantastic, I'm from Nashville. Where's Mojo? It's in the factory in Franklin. Mojo Tacos is so fucking good. Damn it, I need tacos. We're not going to have time to go to Mojo's. I need to text Dr. B. Dr. B, we need to go to Mojo. I'm not going to have time because I got to do quick bits. I need to find a day this week I can get to Mojo's. It's been too long. Kim T said, what's up with the witness chair? It looks fucking awful. Are they purposely trying to make people uncomfortable? I don't know. It looks terrible. The mic doesn't come up high enough for those that are tall. It's just weird. How far into law school was he? Yeah. He seems to have handled himself extremely well. I don't cross know. Examination. I'm going to pull some of these up while we're getting into cross. Yes, My cousin Vinny's doing this cross examination. I don't know what's happening. Maybe, maybe my cousin Vinny's doing the cross examination. I don't really know what's happening. 
Can I call you Buster? Yes, sir. I'm John. <coughs> and I want to, first off, I'm Dan, John. I am sorry about your mother. Sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry about his mother. <laughs> Holy shit. And I'm sorry about your brother. Hoots. Thank you. And I'm sorry about your grandfather. All right. I'm sorry for all of your losses. Thank you. And I'm sorry about your grandfather. Thank you. Poot yelling at Metters. Nice to me when I was a young assistant solicitor. I'm sorry for your loss. Yes, sir. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Your grandfather was nice to me. You, okay. Your grandfather was nice to me when I was a young assistant solicitor. Hold on. I We're going back just a few seconds. I want to see Poot lose his mind. I just, I wanted to see it. I wanted to see it. As Metters is getting his shit together. This is what I wanted to say. Can I call you Buster? Yes, sir. I'm John. <coughs> and I want to first off tell you I am sorry about your mother. Sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry about his mother. <laughs> it's better with video. I'm sorry about your brother. It's better with video. And I'm sorry about your grandfather. Thank you. He was nice to me when I was a young assistant solicitor. I'm sorry for your loss. Yes, sir. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I don't have any questions for you, Buster. Okay. I don't have many questions. Stay in the box, Metters. Stay in the box. When you are leaving the main house, you told Mr. Griffin that the, the main entrance was the brick entrance. Yes, sir. But there's also a side entrance. Or by the kennels, or yeah. Entrance exit. I'm. Yes, sir. Okay. Just a totally different entrance. And the mailbox was at the side entrance. Yes, sir. The mail. I, the miss. The kennel entrance. Yes, sir. Okay. <sighs> Why was that? Do you know? I don't know. I think it's just the. The captions have lost their mind today. I really don't know. Okay. I don't either. But the packages would come to. You said the kennel side. They would come to the shed. Okay. And a lot of times, y'all would use that kennel. Entrance exit to go just like you'd use the main one, right? Yeah, you, you, you would. I would say that I, I'm more so tended to use the, the the main one, the one that I say is the is the brick pillars. But yeah, I mean you could certainly leave either way. If you were leaving the main entrance mm -hmm. and you got down you're leaning the house and you're going toward the brick. He just wants to wander. And then you know where it's kind of a wire where it kind of cuts off to the kennel too, right? Sure. So you go straight or left. If you were leaving at night going straight, and if you were looking out to the left and the lights were on, you, you'd be able to see the lights on at the kennel just from that little wire, wouldn't you? Maybe, depending Good. on what lights were on and whatnot. Question. I mean, if it was fully lit up, maybe. Okay. And I'm just from that wire, instead of going straight, if you... From that distance, you'd be able to, if the lights were on fully, you'd probably be able to see them. Oh, yeah. yes, sir. the prosecution found their their direct questions, but it's cross. You get to lead now, Metters. We'll get we'll get to some more pointed leading questions, but I appreciate that he started out with, look, I'm sorry for your loss. Almeida, I have a few questions. It'll be brief. He's not going to go in. Where your grandma and granddaddy were. Is that close to the, I think you, it's, it's close to the law firm, isn't it? Almeida? Yes. Sir. Close to the law firm? I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, how, 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 anywhere in Hampton is close to anywhere in Hampton because it's not very big. Fair enough. But, I mean, it's a 10-minute, it's a 10, <laughs> 10 minute, 12-minute drive out to Almeida, I would think, from, from the law firm. Frankie's mom said if they produced the clothes, it would solve it. The defense doesn't have to produce anything. Sled should have searched for it, and they didn't. So the defense doesn't have to prove anything. They just have to poke holes. So... We'll talk about Jim on the HBO Max commentary ladder. I think, Mr. Duck, did you bring up 131? Can I ask him to do that? Sure. I know Mr. Harpin makes so, but this is a great I will try to be louder. Um, Jacqueline said, love your commentary and live experience, lived experience knowledge question. Are we sure Buster was a law student? He seemed lost on not speaking here, saying my opinion. I think it's hard to be a witness. So you don't have to get, but... You see, is this kind of where you said everybody He was a law student. It's right. Verified. <clears throat> so if you look... No, sir, you can't. 
So if you look right off this point. You might want to come down here if you don't mind. Just the jerk. Oh, Selena, that's new information about the Idaho so case and the TikTok right psychic. Here, this is kind of the, what I'm referring to as like the back corner of the house. And it would basically, you would come around, there's a big oak tree here, you come around it, and then you basically pull up, and you would probably stop the hood of your car right in, you know, right off. Um, but it was raining. Corner of the house. So it'd be closer to here than over here. You're about right in here. So right in here. Yeah, I mean, because you don't want to pull up super close to it. Yeah, be right out. Okay. But right there was a driveway here. all in, paved driveway in here, right? There is a paved driveway over towards the side of the house. Where are the okay. photos and, of that? really not many tire tracks. The, the grass looks good in here. <laughs> yep. I don't know when these pictures were taken, but it's a little dead right there. I don't know when these pictures right? were taken. Okay, you can have a seat back. Thank you, please. Wait, when did you... When did you first... Mention that to anybody about parking in the, in the in the yard there. What do you mean? I mean, like, when did you first discuss that with anybody as far as where the car is parked at um, your grandma and granddad's house? When was the first time you talked to anybody about that? Um, last week. Last week when we saw the GPS couple data. Days, a couple days ago. A couple yeah. days ago. Yep. Okay. That's the first time you mentioned that? Sure. Okay. And then that would have been. Um, no, the jury knows what it means. Don't ask. Don't ask. Don't Shelley ask. Testified, right? Shelly Smith. I guess I don't really remember when Miss Smith testified. Miss Smith. I don't think Buster likes him very much. Did you bring that to somebody's attention, or did somebody ask you about it? I couldn't. I'm not sure. You know, Jim asked him. And, and I think you. Um, it was a few days ago. And I'm on cross. <laughs> um, you testified that. Um, how many times had you been there with your dad? I wasn't quite clear with your answers, to Mr. Griffin. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I understand. And I can't give you an approximate number, but I mean, I've been out there with him several times. And, um, would you always call? You said you call. Did you always call when you got there? Yeah, I feel like most of the time you would call just to tell, you know, because the ladies get nervous, you know, if you if you aren't if you hadn't called and they see a car pulling in the driveway, you know, it's just easier to call and let them know, like, hey, we're going to be pulling around, you know, please unlock the door. It's a good question. Or we'd like to come in. Had you ever been over there at six thirty in the morning? Have I ever been out there at six thirty in the morning? These are good questions. Any, matters. I mean, just like. Overall, of my, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've I've been out there at six thirty in the morning before going going hunting and whatnot. And you call then also then, right? Well, if that was going into the house. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I would just let them know, especially six thirty in the morning. Sure. Okay. Don't call me at six thirty in the morning. Don't come to my house at six thirty in the morning. I don't want to participate in anything that requires me to be up yes, at six thirty in the morning. I love it. stuff. Great. She was actually getting some work done down there, wasn't she? Yes, sir. She was getting some work done on the house. I'm glad you love Edisto. And, um, on this date, June 7th, um, literally, there were people inside doing work that day, weren't they? I think so. Yeah. And her plan was to stay down there that night, wasn't it? I don't know. I don't know what her plan was. The always calling before grandparents is important because the day Alec was seen moving things around super early in the morning... They didn't call to let um, the you caregivers had, um, know they were there. I think the last time you've been to Moselle, you said was the spring, maybe a few months prior to this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you have to say yes for the court reporter, not for me. Just yes. Just for Sorry. Oh, let him get snappy. It's all right. Matters, let him get snappy if he's going to get snappy with you. Let it happen. Yes, sir. And I think you had talked to Paul the last time on the 5th, if I'm not mistaken, June 5th. That's what you told him on the interview. Sure. Okay. And Mr. Griffiths, to ask you about the financial 
troubles and that have come out here, you had no knowledge of your finance, your dad's financial difficulties at all, did you? No, sir. I mean, you really did. No, sir. I really didn't. And, he acted uh, like everything was normal. As far as you knew, financially, the family was sound. Yes, sir. Okay. You went to Walford. I did go to Walford. Go Terriers, for the record. Thank you. Um, but but everything, as far as you knew, financially was okay. The Walford what? And um, when did you learn it what? Uh, <clears throat> I guess on September the, the roadside. For whatever that day in September was. What day? The day so what back happened? In the, um, the birthday, I guess, for your dad, Memorial Day down at Edisto. Sure. Um, defense exhibit, and I apologize. I don't know what number it was just played. I hope he's getting to that the dad was able to act Mr. like Chris everything Wilson was normal. Was your dad. Yes, sir. Okay. He's a family friend. Yes, the Wofford Terriers. Thank you You didn't all. know then that he owed your dad owed Chris Wilson or stole 192000 from him, did you? I did not. And I'm not saying that'd be mean, but you really didn't know that. That's that's correct. Didn't know. And this boating, the boating accident. I believe Buster that, didn't uh, know. Mr. Griffin asked you about that. Was pressure on the family, wasn't it? I don't know on. that pressure is the right word. I mean, it's it's definitely an an, an uneasy feeling. You know, your your brother is criminally charged, and then you. Myself and my father have civil charges. I mean, definitely unsettling. That's fair. I mean, it caused stress within the family, didn't it? It, it, it was it was stressful. I wouldn't say sh within the family because I mean, you know, we supported each other. And, sure. And I'm not I'm not questioning that, but I mean, is your mom felt ostracized. Yes, sir. She even more so wanted to say that and stuff. Yes, sir. It really, she didn't want to be, she didn't want people talking about her and looking at her and talking about her. I mean, you were a little frustrated with Paul yourself, weren't you? In, In terms of as as using your ID and getting all that. And I'm, that case is over. Okay. Sure. But I mean, you didn't like it when you used your ID yourself. Oh. Um, and I'm not trying to go anywhere, Buster, but he'd use your matters, ID sometime and you didn't want him to. Matters, ask the question. Questions you're going to ask. I'm Questions, sorry. comments. What's the question? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Did you like it? What's the question? Did he, he used your ID, didn't he? Jackson Railroad. I'm sorry. Can you say it again? <laughs> Did Paul use your identification? Yes. Did that frustrate you? Sometimes. Okay. They're allowed to be frustrated. He's trying to say, I'm not going anywhere. But you've got to be going somewhere where it's not relevant is the thing. He's trying to say, I'm not trying to trick you or trap you, but he, he was shown the tree video to ask it with the shirt and the pants. You remember that? Yes, sir. When you saw your dad on the night of June 7th, what do you have on? When I had made my way up to the house, he is, was wearing um, shorts and a, and a T-shirt. You're going to ask about the kennel video. And uh, that's all I want to know. Who took who laundry his clothes? Um, at, at that period of time, uh, would have been Blanca. And then my mom also does laundry sometimes. But on a day to day, did Blanca take care of your dad's clothes, laundry, cleaning, folding? Yes, sir. I hope he asked about the kennel video, but I don't know if he's gonna. Oh, Law and Lumber, I agree that, that the judge was right to cut him off. Absolutely agree. The judge was right to come off. It's just so about, odd. Um, you never went back to Mazelle after this incident. Well, I mean, after did you? I'm, if you take June seventh on June, I mean, I've got, I've been back to Moselle since then, but I've never slept on a, another night at Moselle. And did your dad? Let's strike that. Big portion don't. Motion for Emily to name her home Nerd Media? Nerd Media? <laughs> Edie Bisto or Lawsville? We do have a name for the house. The house has a name. We're going to start naming the rooms so it feels more luxe. 
might start Big calling the, the bathroom the salon. We've you've begged our indulgence multiple times, Matters. Are you going to ask about the kennels video or not? That's all we want to know. Dad tried to get you to go hunting out there again one time or suggest it. Um, he he asked if I wanted to and and if I wanted to that I could. Did he say he was going to let Jim go hunt to. out there? No, sir. Did, didn't want to go. Did your dad allow Jim to go hunt the land? We heard that in the jail calls. That's all I have. Thank you, Buster. Yes, sir. Didn't even ask it. All right. Redirect. Buster, if your mother... I would have asked. When she, when she went to Edisto and stayed for multiple nights, would she take Bubba with her? Yeah, usually. She'd take a combination of, of Bubba and <gasps> maybe another dog, Grady. So they're going to argue she wasn't she, staying she at Edisto because Bubba her, yes. wasn't there, but she was having work done at the house. And, and if you're having you construction done, you're not going to take the Bubba dogs. Bubba and Grady were at Moselle the night of June 7th. Right? I do. Yes, sir. That's all I have you. Anything further? Oh, we're done. If you're Thank having you. construction done at a home, you're not going to take the dogs to stay at the house we're when you've witness. got to go to doc <laughs> doctor's appointments and stuff. So that is the end of the cross with Buster. What would I have asked? I would have said, you know, you've got these boat cases and you've got the criminal cases and you now know that your dad was stealing from clients and confronted by Chris Wilson, but he didn't act like anything was wrong, did you? I would have asked that. He was still acting like things were normal. You still thought things were normal. You didn't know anything was going on because you couldn't see the stress. You left on Bible and raise your right. If you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth. That's a and big old truth, file folder. Oh, thank you. What are we talking about? Finances? It's a lot of case file. So that's what I would have asked on that cross. Adjust that microphone and pull it closer to you if you need to. Pull your seat up, but state your name for the record and spell your last name, please. Mike Sutton, S U T T O N. Uh, Mr. Sutton, um, what do you do for a living? I'm a forensic engineer. A forensic engineer. Now, what is a forensic engineer? Well, the majority of the work that I What's do so forensic about involves it? the investigation of accidents and failures huh? in the field of um, legal questions, legal problems, court of law. So what forensic engineers do is that they collect data, collect physical evidence, they interpret the data, and then try to come up with what happened in an event, maybe what didn't happen in an event, or maybe try to limit the possibilities of what happened in an event. Okay, and do you are have they having a, an engineer a background in this area, or have you been trained, or how about just tell us, um, first of all, where you, as we say around here, where are you from? Well, I was born in Hickory, North Carolina. Are they having an I engineer re grew up in Cary, do the crime when I was scene? Young. Family moved to Cary, which is right outside of Raleigh. When I graduated from Cary High School, I went to North Carolina State University, and I was in the materials engineering department for about a year. In my sophomore year, I transferred over to the mechanical engineering department. And so I was at NC State um, from my undergraduate from 84 to 88. And when I was a sophomore, I met an, uh, an engineer named Wait, Dr. Charles Manning. He said the name of a, a college without Raleigh. saying the uh, mascot. Away, That's not there. allowed in this trial. And if Dr. you say Manning the name, the name of a school. professor at State. He's also an ex-NASA engineer you have to say the and mascot I worked with him from basically 1987 then after i graduated i went full-time with him when you graduated you graduated Dude. with a degree in what in mechanical engineering okay and, and you were working with him working with him and i continued to work with him and thank then you I got the a chat has fixed it at north carolina state university also in mechanical engineering with a concentration in acoustics and vibrations and acoustics and vibrations correct your masters okay. yes and then what did you do well, I worked with him as, and a, as a consulting engineer, consulting forensic engineer, looking at all different kinds of accidents and failures, about anything that you can imagine. We do a lot of motor vehicle accidents, of course, because there's so many. We look at structural failures, product failures, material failures, um, about anything that you can imagine. But basically, if it fails, uh, we're there. If there's anything that's based in physics, it's it's capable of being explained and understood. And so, what do you mean by physics? Well, physics <laughs> is, is, are, are, the, are the laws that govern how 
how things around <laughs> us, how they behave, you can predict their behavior. Okay. Uh, if, you know, if, if I drop a basketball off of a balcony, I can predict how long it's going to take to reach the ground based on all the different variables. So the laws of physics are there. It helps us figure out. They're simple and finite, happen. just like hair care. So wouldn't you agree? I worked with Dr. Manning uh, for a while until 2000, end of 2000. And in 2001, I founded my current company, which is based in Cary. It's called Accident Research Specialists. So we what's do, what's we the name do of it again? Accident Research Specialists in Cary, okay. North Carolina. And we do the same thing. Uh, there, there are 10 engineers that I work with and support staff. And we investigate, analyze a variety of cases for a variety of clients. Like I said, most of my work is related to either criminal cases or civil cases. And I do some consulting that's not related to courtroom issues, um, just straight consulting to companies. Have you, um, from time to time, uh, dealt with shooting instant reconstruction? Yes, I have. And tell the there jury what shooting instant <clears throat> reconstruction is. Well, the shooting incident reconstruction, at least how I'm involved with it, I deal with um, what would be called external ballistics and terminal ballistics. So external ballistics are the flight of a bullet after it leaves a gun. A bullet leaving the barrel of a gun is going to be affected upon by gravity, air resistance. So that's just physics. And then there's terminal ballistics, which is what happens to a projectile. This is what we thought we were going to get, but he talked so much object. about... Vehicle um, failures. I was how many confused. times have you been involved in a case involving shooting instant reconstruction? I would say over the years, maybe 50. Okay. Now, all different kinds. Like, for instance, it could be a case where a manufacturer is being sued for like a drop fire where somebody dropped a pistol and it went off. And it's not supposed to do that. No. And okay. so it could be a products case. I've worked on cases involving hunters, you know, long range distance shots where you're trying to figure out where a particular hunter was aiming the gun, so he, where he, he hit, killed somebody. I've worked um, certainly in law enforcement shootings. I've worked for law enforcement, and I've worked on the side opposite law enforcement for people who have been shot by law enforcement. I've worked on insurance cases. Sometimes there's a question about whether it was a suicide or an accident. So those are the type of cases that I would be involved with. And um, okay. when you do these cases, you're looking for... I mean, what's the difference between you and a crime scene no leading. reconstructionist? Well, crime scene reconstructionist uh, would be looking at a lot of different things. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I deal with physics. But somebody who works at crime scene may have Nana, a, also got a you, background in, let's say, chemistry. And they may be using different reagents to find blood or gunshot residue. That's not what I do. But I physically reconstruct a site. One, one of the, the main things that we do in forensic engineering such as myself, accident reconstruction is what it is, is that we have the ability to go and, and, and capture data, collect facts from a, from a site, whether it's an accident or a murder or what have you. And then what we do is we interpret what we're finding and try to, again, put ourselves in a position to answer questions about how an event occurred or maybe limit what could have occurred or maybe what didn't occur. Okay, so um, have you ever been qualified by state or federal court uh, to testify um, about a shooting incident reconstruction? Um, As an in, expert. Uh, for instance, in Wake County, North Carolina. Yes. And what was that? Uh, was that in federal court? It, that was in federal court. Wait, and once? were you uh, allowed to testify as an expert? He's qualified yes. as an expert once. Okay, now um, let me move on to... Um, and I believe the name of that case is Michael Morgan versus Wake County Sheriff's Office, correct? That is correct. And that was 2018? Yes. Now, um, you've been involved in many more cases. Have you ever been qualified additionally to that by any federal or state court to testify about a Oh, um, this, the state incident? might want to avoid your yes, I, I have testified in other criminal trials where the questions were just as I said, which is where was the weapon aimed, maybe how many shots were fired, where were the shots fired from? maybe the sequence hmm. of shots. Again, this is all, you know, de developing an understanding of what the physical evidence tells you. Okay. So let me move to a second area of expertise I'm gonna ask you about. Tell us um, about what acoustics engineering is. Well, acoustics- Is he gonna talk about whether he could hear the shots or not? Mechanical engineering. It's a study of how sound moves, how it's made, 
how it may be, how sound may decrease over distance, um, the effect of sound on people. It's obviously something real important uh, because if you're exposed to sound for long periods of time, you can lose part of your hearing. So it, it, it is a so uh, would subset someone have of heard engineering. The and guns? Um, so I have testified in cases okay. involving acoustics. My master's paper was in the area of something that I do quite often, which is the audibility of emergency vehicles. Like if a police oh. car has a siren on and you're driving up to an intersection, you got the radio on. Can you hear the siren? Did you turn the radio up and turn the radio the on? Maybe it makes a difference if your window is up or down. Those types of issues, so the audibility of noise. Was the singer to do, singing your uh, song? that kind of analysis, do you have to do some sort of reconstruction oftentimes? Yes, often um, with acoustics, uh, you can definitely look at it theoretically, but I typically test it because it's something that is readily testable. Okay. And you've been qualified, again, in at least one state. Uh, you've been qualified many, multiple times to what? testify as to acoustical engineering. Yes. And so one of those cases was more qualified um, in acoustic engineering versus CSX acoustical. in state court in Richmond, Virginia. Um, is that correct? Yes. And many other times also. Yes. It seems like he's mostly okay, the a last car, area of expertise. Uh, all these are engineering related, correct? They are. Is um, accident reconstruction involving vehicles. Yes. And you've done that more than you've probably done the other two. Correct? Why are we it is, um, qualifying him as a vehicle, vehicle reconstructionist? Just because there's so many of them throughout my career. Relevant. 36 years, I've looked at. Someone make it make sense. Probably a couple of thousand motor vehicle wrecks. And again, you apply these same principles, um, data, and then you do an engineering analysis of it, mathematics, trigonometry, those kinds of things. Is that correct? Yes. And you have been qualified multiple times on that issue. Yes. As that's, an expert to give an opinion. That's different. Yes. And again, going back to the other two, you've been qualified as an expert to give an opinion uh, by uh, many courts, several courts in shooting incident reconstruction. Many or several. Acoustics engineering and in motor vehicle um, uh, reconstruction. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Many and several are different, Dick. Your Honor, I move uh, that this witness be qualified as a wit as a expert in, in the three areas I just mentioned. This is the state. <clears throat> No objection. Oh, he's admitted without objection. Okay, as an expert in the fields that he's offered. Okay, so yeah. let's start off with. I'm surprised I didn't voir dire him. The, Truly, um, shooting instant Truly reconstruction. Surprised. Okay, yes. Now, have you prepared a PowerPoint? Well, back off. Back off. Strike that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually technically withdrawn. Technically, Were you it's withdrawn. you hired by myself, and Mr. Griffin, to do some analysis on what occurred. Back off. At Moselle. It was odd. That resulted in the deaths of Paul and Maggie Murdo. Yes. And. Um, that was odd. What is. Let's first of all talk about what generally. What's the process generally? And then we're going to put this PowerPoint up. Or do you want me to put the PowerPoint up first? I can speak to that generally. So, okay. I think I mentioned it earlier, but Red Buster really the was not the first in witness. Investigation. If it's a little investigation, big investigation, my job. There were the two people on, I work with and people in Friday. other companies that do what we do. You go collect facts. And in this case, this is and this is typical, facts were collected. The crime scene was processed. There were a lot of pictures taken, They're arguing things like how to that. interpret those facts. facts. So that's one place that I can get facts. Um, Every time he says I facts, typically do, and I, I want to yell. Case, I go collect facts myself. So I went to Moselle and it, it had changed. I went there about 18 months after the murders. I went in October of 22, but I was able to Trees of measure the Moselle property um, and look at the physical evidence, what was remaining. And then I was able to use that in conjunction with what SLED had done because SLED had, had collected a lot of evidence at the scene that, that I looked oh, at. Someone now, thinks SLED uh, the, collected some a lot of evidence. Good to see. that you looked at um, were measurements made by uh, SLED agent Worley um, either the night of or soon after the incident to things like shell casings, right? That is correct. And there's also pictures of those shell casings, correct? Yes. And also the location of Maggie's body 
And yes, it's leading. It's foundational. They're not going to object to it because it's just getting through and the did, uh, background Agent, stuff that's uh, not Warley in controversy. Also, um, uh, find two bullet holes: one in the doghouse, one in the quail pen. Yes. And did she take measurements there? If they go back she to did. shooters in and the trees, I'm going to lose my mind. They were. It was. It was what I was looking at, at least in my role in looking at the crime scene or the side of the crime. The questions that I was being asked. Okay, so I see um, chat saying hi to lead attorney. Hello, lead attorney. I know. Have you ever told anyone to back off in court like that, or told yourself to back off in court out loud? It was an odd. It was an odd. Statement and generally, I say withdrawn to questions, not strike that. But I'm less old school. I mean, I'm old, but I'm less old school than Poot is. But back off, back off is my new objection. Objection, back off this PowerPoint. Any objection? God love a PowerPoint. I'm here for the PowerPoint chat. The, the um, references to Monty Python are uh, actually Honor, cracking up. Evidence, defendant's exhibit number 143. Oh, a whole, Without objection, I believe. A whole last PowerPoint. Let's <laughs> let's just see. Everything's evidence in this trial, so I'm here for it. Let's just bring it all in. Um, and Your Honor, um, okay, let's just walk through the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, go to the next slide, please. Go okay. to the next now, this is titled Shot Trajectories as Measured by Special gonna, Agent Worley. I'm going to switch it, so we don't lose. What we're talking about, uh, measurement she made. Yes. Okay, oh, next the slide, text. Please. Hold on. Quail pen. We can't because I backed up. Um, go ahead. Now, what are we looking at here? I sped so up this to 1.25 to catch it's up to a live. a small animal cage. It's been referred to. But like it's a bird cage. And it's up against the building or the barn or the hangar. I think a it's been small called animal things. pen. It's up underneath the roof. Okay. Now, if you went perpendicular to that, um, out. Would you run into the um, the dog kennels? Yes. Okay. So this is across from the dog kennels, um, and that is quail pen. Yes. And this particular photograph was taken the night of the murder. So the the first few pictures just show the points of evidence that were of interest to me. That I was a little behind in time. That's why I sped it on, up. It was the next month, I believe, it was July the sixth. Uh, Special Agent Worley went back and actually took some measurements. It's a, she used a, basically a common technique. Where you try to get more information. Where about you measure. Problems. Okay. Next. She used a common technique where you try to. What is this we're looking at? Measure. It's a little bit closer view of the quail pen. And what you have there on the side of the quail pen. So it would be the side that's really facing the crime scene. Right. Um, it's made out of like a fiber board. A little bit more robust than cardboard. It's like a fiber board. So it's, you can penetrate it easily. And there was a bullet hole basically in the center of it. Okay. Next slide. That would be that bullet hole? That is the bullet hole. And. Uh, if, if you were able to zoom in a little bit and look carefully, you'd be able to see what's called a bullet wipe. It's down. It's a, you know, if, you, if that was a tiny little clock, it'd be just under three o'clock. And um, so when I looked at that, it looked like the bullet was on an upward trajectory, a small one, but an upward trajectory. Because of the and way what the bullet it wipe hit. is, is when the bullet comes out of the barrel of the gun, it's going to have uh, products of, uh, of the, the bullet being fired. And when it enters sheetrock or a car door or a piece of plywood, you commonly see that lead in mark where the bullet goes into a piece of material. Can we make that bigger? There we go. Okay. So how about step down here for just a second? And there's a pointer right behind you. Your They're talking about down. the little bit of a blob. Right Wait, hold on. Would you point out for the Over jury, please, the that side, we call it a bullet wipe? Like three o'clock down here. The dark, yeah, so when the dark look at the entry, when the entrance of a bullet hole into a surface like this is, so this is the piece of gray cardboard. Upward trajectory. Um, there's some tearing here, but if you look over here in the side, that's what's called the bullet white mark. And that shows you the direction that is coming from. So it's coming from where I'm standing. And it's a little bit below, like if you could draw a straight line through there, that would be even with the horizon. It's a little bit below that. So right away that told me that this bullet, when it penetrated this piece of material here, that it was traveling upwards and from, um, from right to left. Okay, let me see the next slide, just in case. These are photos taken by okay, Sled. Um, Sled measured these, so Sled believed they were from that night. And that's make that a little bigger? Part of why they're addressing it now. While he's doing that, what are we looking at here? Uh, this is a photograph um, from Special Agent Worley's um, trip to the crime scene. I think it was the next month, July the 6th. What's going on here? So this, this bullet, it uh, penetrates this quail pen and actually goes through the wall of the hangar, too. It goes through several layers of material. And a common technique to try to figure out what is the angle of that shot, you take something Rotting like this, it. 
typically they're fiberglass, so they, they don't bend, they're perfectly straight. Rotting. And you insert that rod through the bullet hole. And then what you do is you measure this rod. So right now she's measuring what's called the vertical angle. So if, if, if I was measuring the, it's the, the um, ang angle of the shot, like to the TV right here. So vertical angle is this way. Was the bullet going up or was it going down or was it going straight in? And what, what did that, um, I mean, did you look at um, a close-up picture of that? And did you also look at her notes? Yes. And what were, what was her conclusion about the angle? You say vertical angle. Experts are allowed to testify about what other experts the, say. Uh, That's why we're talking about end. this. Was it going up? Was it going down? And by, uh, I guess you gauge this in degrees, correct? Correct. Okay. So these are all sleds photographs. Up. At what um the prosecution Agreed. didn't ask so sled about it much, the but these are all from upwards, sled. Which is consistent with what I just showed you on the previous pictures. So her measurement that it's going up is consistent. Um, she recorded in her notes that that was three degrees going up. So pretty flat, but uh, the bullet was traveling upwards. But there are two pictures. She has one picture of it at three degrees and one at one and a half degrees. So pretty close, but two different trajectories. And later on, I looked at the difference between the one and a half and the three. Okay. And uh, we could that, that'll come up later, but... For the purposes of me understanding what was going on here, I considered both one and a half and three. And while one and a half or three is not a steep incline. At, Martha, at, that's helpful feedback. I'll in, take a look at why it's populating that, that way. Thank have, you. If you go 10 feet, it's going to make okay. As you project it back, what, if any, difference um, is there on that cause on trajectory? Okay, well, the reason this is interesting is because it's an upward traveling bullet. So if, if, you, if you think about the path of this bullet, for all purposes here, because we're talking about maybe 50 feet, in this crime scene, it's, it's not 400 yards. If it's 400 yards, the bullet has a curved trajectory. So here, because the the area that we're considering is so small, that for all intents and purposes, it's a flat trajectory, which means that the barrel of the gun was on the same angle as that rod, okay? And it's going down, which means if you extend that rod, if you're able to extend that rod some distance, it's going to go into the ground. So if it goes into the ground, obviously the gun can't be underground. So you know that the shooter, who fired the weapon that 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 sent the bullet into the quail pen has to be on that line. So the weapon has to be on that line, and it's going to go into the ground at some point. So that that is a good piece of information because that locks the location of the shooter at least for one shot. And um, I believe uh, Agent Worley identified. I'm sorry, strike that. What's wrong? What if any caliber or kind of weapon did Agent Worley deduce that fired that bullet? Uh, this was the 300 blackout. Okay. Now go to the next uh, slide, please. So SLED did this work. This is an expert looking at SLED's work and contextualizing a, the work that they've gathered. Um, this may be the one that's closer to your traditional to one battle of the degrees, experts, if you will. But you can see this is called, they call them trajectory rods, uh, which again is inserted through the multiple paths of the bullet as it, as it went through things. So as you look at that device, whatever that's called, um, one of them shows one and a half, one of them shows three, and she wrote down three correct okay great next please poot asked whirly a lot about oh, this? this it just uh, got so thing. boring that all of us were like kind of the different because we uh, didn't have context the for different it. readings that she got here okay. it was within a range okay so so same answer for this right next so whirly is showing her work okay so what are we looking at now this to explain a little bit better. Can you give me a, make that a little bigger, please? Okay, so what are we looking at here? This is to show the trajectory rod. It comes in. We've, we've the been looking at this side. continuing to right go here. through this way. But if you look inside, you see it kind of goes through the cage. It goes through the back of the cage. It actually goes into the hangar or the barn. It goes through the siding and then the plywood. So the so that that is that same rod, except... That's the inside going out. Correct? That's the inside. I was just trying to show the technique. And, and this te technique is a technique that is is used often. There are other ways to do it, and we may talk about it later. But this is a technique that's often used to come up with this um, line of fire or the path that that bullet took. Because if you consider the path of the bullet, you may be able to conclude something from that. Okay, next. It's just more the same. This is the trajectory. More of the same is always helpful. The cage or the quail pin. That's okay. easier to see, though. That trajectory rod does make it easier to more see. More the same. Next. More the same. But th these are okay. Wait one second. Um, 
So these pictures just and we saw uh, these when Worley testified that rod coming from the outside going through the quail pen and through the the the, uh, the wall behind the quail pen. That is correct. And that's you put that rod through, and then you can make some measurements outside as to tra tra trajectory. Correct. That's correct. Tra easy for you to say. Um, next, please. No one's talking about What's um, going on there? This is called a zero edge protractor. So tractor is going to measure zero to 180 degrees. So this is a uh, special agent war. He puts it up against the side of the quail pen and drop a plumb bob down. So you can get what's called the azimuth and the azimuth is just your compass direction. So because if I have the azimuth and this is about 41 degrees coming in from where I'm standing. So, you know, 45 degrees would be, you know, here there's 41 degrees, 90. And that's what the witness said. Straight in. So what that does is it tells you that we're back to protractors. This line. So, you know, at that point, you know, whether it's going up or down and you know whether it's coming from the left or the right. That's correct. And as we look at that coil pen, is it coming from yeah, poots, poots over here? Chuckle didn't to land the left, this morning. It's coming from the right. Well, it's coming from over here to the right. OK. And then to determine exactly how you need to go back and kind of look, um, you have to do it to scale, of course. Right. right? So you, you have to create a, a scale diagram or you do what we typically do, which is we scan. OK, so. let me see the next one. And is that just a close up of the the um, measurement the angle? Yes. And you can see here. And I will say for those asking about the uh, podcast, it is ordered newest episode to oldest. So that might be a setting next. within your podcast app. Now, this is the doghouse. The podcast app you can pick how you order and the podcast in a minute we're going to see a 3d rendition of this so well, just show us the 3d rendition of where everything is yes but let's go ahead and um, talk about the doghouse next the mm. doghouse i think is so, more valuable you see there because so you the still dog had a casing had a in, it. Hole in it it's pretty low to the ground it's about five and a half inches above the ground three inches up from the bottom of the siding on the doghouse that is low and this bullet hole was going downwards 14 degrees down and um, it, it had an angle slightly to the left. We know that Maggie and was also so going down kind of based the same on way that you can think about the, the way that, that her body up. was falling as she was being shot. Down. So if put a trajectory rod in, we'll see that in a second, it's going to be sticking upwards like that. So you can go up that trajectory rod to a point where it makes no sense. Like the shooter would have to be on a ladder, right? So that, doesn't make what sense. that does is it tells you where that shot came from and it puts a, it puts a limit on where that shooter could be. Um, you know, just the same way that the shot trajectory would disappear into the ground makes no sense. You know, shot trajectory that's up at 10 feet doesn't make any difference either. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Not up in the right. trees. So the shot trajectory is just coming down, but we know the shooter was okay, and what is that? shooting down. That towards is the 300 Maggie. blackout projectile. It went into the doghouse, went into a dog bed. So you're able to dig there were out. no dogs so in the dog bed. You can see that here. So again, these are the the night of the murders. So if it didn't go through the back wall, how does one get a trajectory off of that? Well, in this particular case, the siding was thick enough where Agent Worley was able to put a dowel rod or a trajectory rod into that hole. Unlike the quail pin, she just stuck the rod in the hole. Thin. So of course, a very thin material. As one does. It's considered thin if the thickness of that material is much less than the length of the bullet right here. So in a thin material, um, there, there's some special considerations with thin materials versus thick materials, but the doghouse had siding and wood construction, so it's thicker. So a thick material is gonna be more in line with the length of the bullet and even longer. So you can still get the trajectory with reasonable accuracy in this particular case. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now what is that? This is the same process here at the doghouse where- Can you blow that, blow that up for me, please? There you go. So what do we see? Uh, this is the trajectory rod. This is a, um, a dial protractor. It just uses gravity to tell you what the angle that's is. That's not and coming out at an extreme degrees down. That's not an extreme angle. It's coming in at a 14 degree, the bullet's coming, there you go. It's coming in, it's coming, down into the doghouse at a 14 degree angle. That's correct. Buster did okay. testify this morning, Joshua. Next, please. And what is this? Zoomed in so you can see. So okay. there, there's 90 and it's over at about 76 degrees or so. So that makes it. That's a 14 degree 
This is showing how Downward much measuring back. Agent yes. Orly did. Next. To be. Agent now, this Orly is that plumbob thing and asthma thing, right? Asthma. So if, if <laughs> Plum this, is, this shows you the compass direction of the shot, where it's coming from. Thanks, closed captioning. And uh, here, it's. Um, she measured seven degrees. She recorded six No dogs were hurt. It's there, incredible, but, it's but no dogs were there. hurt. All you really got to know, it's not straight into the doghouse. No dogs were in the doghouse that night. Six or seven degrees. Okay. Next. We're going to keep answering that question. That's just a close up of the same thing. Yeah. So there's 90. So the palm bob would be right here if it was going straight into the doghouse, but it's a little bit to the left. About six or six, six degrees. Six or seven, seven degrees. degrees. Okay. Next. I have the SpongeBob. Now tell me what this is. Oh, this is so helpful. So this is uh, Agent Worley's diagram. I don't think we got to see this one earlier. And these are just the lines that I drew in. Exhibit A. To begin with, you know, before I really did much work in the case. And it's clearly not to scale because, for instance, from the small animal cage, that pole is 24 feet about. And you can see that um, Maggie's body is, you know, 17 feet long. I find the diagrams you know, very it's, helpful. It's, but it, it says not to scale. But what that doesn't do for you, it really doesn't tell you, okay, well, we, we went through all that trouble to measure these. What does it tell you? And what I noticed was this, is that that there was two shots and one was into the dog house, which oh, was they facing might be. this way. One was into the quail pen, which is like facing the way of this, this desk here. That's two totally different directions. So the first thing that would be good to do is to draw those lines backwards and see where they cross, right? But we're and not going to get to a point for a while. Of interest there, this is right? foundation. Footprints or something. Um, in this case, there was, but not footprints, but that's what you do here. And so the thing you're looking at is, is, is let's, let's figure out what this is telling us, which is these two lines are going to cross. Rando from somewhere. Iowa, don't tell well, Nightbot and, and that Nightbot's not, not scale, a person. So it doesn't tell you much it about doesn't it. really tell us much because they don't Nightbot cross gets sassy. the right spot. Right. But in terms of the relationship of different teasing. Um, objects, we see the quail pen, um, and it looks like it is... Again, perpendicular to oh, the sled dog never account, did right? one to scale, Elspeth. Yes. Okay. No, sled didn't Next. do one to scale. Sure didn't. They took the okay, measurements. So this is your reconstruction. So um, in their report, sled took the measurements, take your, uh, but they didn't build a diagram to scale. But I'm all sorry. the measurements were oh, in their report. Second. Let me see what this does. They also Next, go ahead. sled did the three D laser scan as well, and no, that's this, in evidence this is too. So this is the Fero scan. This is um. So Sled did do well, this I as well. Explain. Was it a video? It is a video. Yeah, go ahead and play it, and then we'll may, may play it again. I love that we're just deciding on I the fly. Let's see the video. Later. Go ahead. I just want to make sure this isn't bigger elsewhere. No. Nope. This is the. Hey, stop it right there for me, Hero you? scanner. Stop it right there. You go. So we see the doghouse. The quail point where the, we just flew by it. Oh, wait a minute. She's starting over again. Okay, go ahead and start. <sighs> this is SLED's 3D scanner. There we go. Being the tech so person on a trial like this would be very right, stressful. Stop it. Right. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. There. Stop. Okay. So we see the doghouse. Point it out, please. We see the kennels. How about point those out? And the I don't think we can see the quail pen yet, but it's going to be up in there, correct? Its demeanor so the is just against this wall. Okay, off go ahead and start it back up. To me. And stop it. Those are all the okay. evidence show flags. The, show the jury again where the quail pen is. Here's the quail pen. Y'all can see the, the quail house? pen back the there. The house is right here. Okay. okay, go ahead and start it up again. You can see all the evidence flags on where the now, bullets um, were. Or where the casings maybe were. Maybe I'll have you explain how you do this. Um, you go ahead and take the stand again, please. Yes. Let me see the next slide while he's going up there. Uh, okay, well, um, we're going to The prosecution we showed this, the Fero scan as well. It's up on the internet, but they didn't. This is called fly through with no roof. So you've eliminated a lot the of roof. It. This is much with, more clear computer to show what it looks like. You get a better sense of perspective. Is that right? That's correct. And, and is this the, to scale? 
it is to scale. It's, when the defense um, is more clear, it helps is, is their kind of theory the of the case stick. To measure a site, it's scanning is used all all over now. I mean, from dentist we'll, offices to uh, everything. But we'll talk in just a minute about how you put this together and the process. I think is on here. Okay. okay, how about let that one go? And this is without you took the roof off of the shed, correct? I did. Okay, go ahead. So again, they we can see the doghouse. We can see Sled did a Firo as well. Their presentation um, was not as easy to follow where as this. Body was, this is a much easier to follow process. Where Paul's body much was, easier correct? to follow presentation. Yes. Okay. Which will be helpful, we'll I do think that one more time. for the jury. Easier to follow, better. So dick barking orders I still find off putting. I'm just I just do. That would be Maggie's body near the doghouse? Yes. And that would be um that would be all body over here, correct? Petunia, That's thank correct. you for the comment. I'm a phlebotomist at work, and a patient of mine says, is that Emily and the Murdoch trial? I love it. Law nerds, law nerds everywhere. I'm glad we're finally getting to see the Firo scan, though. It's helpful. And why did you do this particular visual? What, does that make it easier to see the, where everything is relative to each other? Yes. Um, in the scan, you can just cut the roof off. It just makes things easier to see. Okay. The, roof, the roof was of no importance to me. Right. The state Next. did not present this as well, but the Firo scans the state took or the now, sled took, I don't know why they represents. didn't present it this easily. Well, this is where I start constructing. Oh, this is his Firo scan. And, sled uh, did a Firo scan too. This is just an overall too. shot, looking straight down. Like this is a bird's eye view of the scan, and uh, the the dog kennels are in the bottom right, and the the hangar, the barn is kind of in the center top of the picture, and it's just um, there's nothing really. Um, you know, of this particular shot, it just illustrates what you can do. And, and what I did, for instance, is there's nothing really of value here, is what he there. just those, said. Those are measurement bars. One's 25 feet long, one's 50 feet long. But the scan itself, you can measure very accurately anywhere in this scan because this is not a picture. What it is are their points. And there's so many points. There's millions of points. And there's so many points when you put them together, it actually looks like an object, like a like a three-dimensional object. So let me ask you this. The, the they state, put in the state's Firo scan. We just didn't get to see it. It's online now. This is called a Faro. Um, but they didn't break it down this way. What is this called? Uh, it, it's a, we call them a Faro scan. Faro is the company that builds the scanner. There are other companies like Nikon that make scanners. But a Faro scan is a laser scanner. And what it does is it sends out a laser. And when that laser hits an object, it returns back to the scanner. It gets reflected Are back. Are the lasers on charts? Depending on how much time that takes, uh, it can figure out how far away that that object is. And we're talking about a very small point. And then what it does is it, because the scanner is spinning around this way and a mirror is spinning this way, it knows where that point is in space. The reason I thought it was the sled one is because it, it still it had better. the flags in it. It spins the camera around and then the camera applies more information all these points so what you end up with are millions of points like if you scan if you scan reformed the mr sin the first one courthouse you pharaoh f-a-r-o and you get people kind of ghosting by as they walk through the scan except no. everything so um no. law enforcement use pharaoh law enforcement does use pharaoh if you scan the sorry the sound clipping out is just trees, i'm done you get signed you get people kind of ghosting by as they walk through the scan so it just picks up everything so um, does law enforcement use Faro? Yes, they did. They did do a Faro scan. I, um, um, I, I have seen their fly through like we just showed you, um, but that's the only thing that I've seen. So they did. The, and again, it is a common technique people in our field. Yes, they use did. to measure things because you don't have to take 100 measurements with a tape measure and it's much more accurate. And they did um, both. Sled, I believe you just said, did a Faro scan of the same murder site. They did. And I think we played it. It's been a month, but I think I played it a month ago. With John. <laughs> it's true. I, At some point in true. this trial, have you, are you familiar with the fact of whether Pharaoh, their Pharaoh scan, the Sweds Pharaoh scan was played? Yes. I don't fucking and know. And is their Pharaoh scan <laughs> as detailed as yours? I would have to compare them, um, but it should. Let's it measure should basically Pharaoh be scans. The same thing. The, Let's do it. Their scan and our scan should be the same because it's a highly precise instrument, and okay. 
Let's Just, go to the next one. The only difference would be they, they did it in July. And you did it in October, October of 22. Okay. Now, what is this to fix? And that's fair. So the next thing I, I wanted to I do. I think you gave a fair answer to saying, hey, it should be the same like as it before. It's not hard. I wanted to know where the evidence markers were. So what this here is, I took uh, Special Agent Worley's measurements. She had measured to a bunch of different things, including the head and feet of, of the victims, and then also to those little yellow evidence marker tags. And the, the evidence markers that I was most interested in were numbers two through seven, which would have been the empty cartridge cases from the 300 blackout. But what I did was, is I created a, a CAD diagram to scale of Agent Worley's measurements. Okay, what's a CAD diagram? It's a so they it's took just computer Worley's drawing, measurements so and made a scale a because package. law enforcement so didn't do can, one. They did a pharaoh, but no diagram. scale diagram. She did this just you know measuring from a pole or post and and whatnot. But we have a technique when we scanned in 22. Obviously, these markers were not there, but we had lots of photographs of them. And so there's a methodology that we can use where we can flatten the picture taken the night of the murders, and then we can match that to the scan. So then once you match that photograph to the scan, you can actually place in objects that no longer exist very accurately. Now, this FARO program, as it, you okay. indicated, was used by SLED. Is it used by other law enforcement agencies? Yes. Very common. It is used by hundreds, thousands of them? Yes. Tech good. And they do the same process that you do? Yes. Okay. So once you got this, and what is this? This is a... This is all laying foundations for whatever his conclusion what is. is. Yeah. So, so this is Special Agent Worley's hand measurements. Put on a, on a computer program. Put it on a computer program. Plotted. And because I'll, I wanted to put the evidence markers in my scan. And so you can, you have the scan of the Moselle property, but then I can put stuff in there too. I could put a car in there, I could put a body, or I could put these evidence markers. So I, I use this to check what we did, was, which we use photographs and the techniques of putting the evidence markers where they belong. Okay, okay. Next, next slide, please. What does this depict? So what this is, is then I overlaid Agent Worley's drawing, the one that we just looked at, over my scan I appreciate and that I they said that. how if, they if, got if there. If you were able to zoom in a little bit, I, I don't know if it's how it may be a little bit hard for you guys to see, but I can those see circles well. with the crosses in them are, are the uh, Special Agent Worley's measurements. And then either touching them or inside of them are the evidence markers that got placed by what we call reverse camera projection, which is just a fancy name of we can take the information from a photograph taken the night of the murders and we can attach that to our scan. And then if we want to, we can put missing objects in there. I'm gonna ask you guys, if okay, this ahead. chart is more clear to you than when Agent Worley testified There's about this, well, being able to see it bigger, is so helpful. Now, when Worley testified, they could see some so of it, what, what is, yeah, but I find this much more helpful. Right there. What does that show? Uh, it shows the same thing. So we use the re reverse camera projection method to get the yellow evidence markers in the scan. And you can see there, uh, Special Agent Worley's measurements are usually right beside it, but you have to remember she was probably stretching a tape measure. So it all makes sense. So this it, is also so revisiting that stuff that's high degree of confidence four weeks ago. That these markers are in the correct place. So the jury okay. needs to remember what happened four weeks ago. So I find that very helpful. Oh. Now, what does this depict? Well, it's ah. a, um, it, it is a video. Okay, if you go ahead and play that. Show video. the whole screen. I'm sorry. Screen, I think this falls under the court's protective order. I really do. Okay. I really do, y'all. I'm sorry. I think this falls under the court's protective order. It's a video. Um, what are we seeing here? I'm going to move. So right. this is fading back and I forth. I think that falls under the court's protective the order. The world or the computer world and reality. Sorry, y'all. So you can see there that that's a crime scene photo that was taken the night of the murders. I, I'm sorry. And what that is doing is it, it's showing you the comparison between. I think that's covered by that the protective order. I really do. What was the physical evidence telling us? Well, picture taken on the night of the uh, murders. Is this a complete picture or have you dropped some things out? No, it's a complete picture. Um, 
I appreciate that the camera operators mm -hmm. went they, back to some items to may to have that. been moved by the time this picture was taken. I would have to go back and see it. Oh, so this was taken. This picture was taken by you in October. Oh no, no, this this is the night of the murders here. Okay. Okay. Next. I don't think. Okay, so go ahead. It wasn't a graphic photo. I just well think they didn't catch it. Shot trajectory. These okay, are so computer tell renderings. Us, tell us what this is. Okay, so I picked a place in the scan to start laying in those lines. So now we've talked about how we built this up. So let's put the trajectory of the two shots that were measured and see what it tells us. And so. So I, with I just the computer chose renderings, we're fine. I'm fine straight with into it, the side of the dog I think house. some of that falls the under the protective order. In the foreground, there would be Maggie's body, and then you can see the evidence markers. There's three, four. You can see five and six over by the sheet. Right. Uh, Twelve is is something else. I believe it was a may have even been uh, bullet fragments. But three, four, five, and six there are empty cartridge cases from the bullets that were fired. Okay. Go go back out a little. For just a second. I think, Deborah, I don't think that was for shock failure. I really think it was. I really yeah. think that those photos by the defense were used to give road. context to what the computer rendering uh, is. That was probably one of one and of to my validate the rendering. I don't. I think that was fair. The jury's tasks. seen much worse. So when you scan, if I you just scan think it falls under the protective. Enough, scan you. Okay. Yes. Next. So that's now. just. Um, me probably being overly sensitive about it, the but I rather do that. The two the shot trajectories into the quail pen. If y'all want to go see it, two? because one is it. at one and a half degrees up, and one is at three degrees up. Okay. And this projection, how did I mean? This is a computer rendering, so the ATV is not in it. If you took the dowel that she put through the hole, so they didn't. Sorry, Your Honor, I'm just trying to get a term. I understand. I'm just trying to ask a leading question, Your Honor. Tell us what that depicts. So the ATV is not in the computer rendering. That I can understand. Yes, so uh, that is the flight path of the bullet somewhere along that line. And so it's just, it's trigonometry. It's, it's Kelly, not any our ponderings are siblings, clearly. Um, I don't know if that's too complicated for you, but it's just trigonometry. The these lines are they put in there by you manually or are they computed by the the um, the, the, the program? Well, it, it the lines are put in by me on the computer program, and again, they're they're the one and a half degrees, three degrees. The importance of them is is that's where the barrel of the gun has to be perfectly in line with that with those two green lines. It has to be somewhere on that spectrum. But right now, without knowing anything else, you could slide that gun up and down that green line, and it could be anywhere. Right? Anywhere so, within that path. But you start looking at other pieces of evidence. And so what, what you would have is, is well, what other pieces of evidence For me, the trajectory rods I looked at this well. and I said, well, where does the shot trajectory go? Well, it goes almost right over Maggie's body very close to it, right close to the feet. That's one thing. The second thing is, is there is a collection of empty cartridge cases right to the line. So if I'm facing the quail pen, there's a collection of cartridge cases to my right. And what's your understanding about the ejection of cartridge, cartridge cases from black enemy? Typically, it should be to the right and to the back somewhat. That's okay. it, it depends. But so that was a piece of information, which is, is that starts to, as I said before, sometimes what you look not you're looking at what you can determine, but maybe you can limit where they something can, happens. That's so, interesting. They can, you know, that is a point of interest. Well, you have a pile of cartridge cases. He's explaining to the jury. Right look, beside the shot trajectory. When you're looking at where the casings point. are, okay, the yes. shot trajectory would be closer to where the casings are within a degree. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Oh, so a that is a shooter that I constructed. And what this is, it's actually a scan of a person. That's way in front so of the case. So you can cases. get scans of people. In this particular case, just for the purposes okay. of this trial, I stripped all the textures off this person. So there's no clothing or hair or skin color, anything like that. So it's just more almost like a mannequin. Um, 
like a robotic looking figure. It, it, it is holding a 300 blackout weapon, a model of one. And so when I started examining those shot trajectories, a couple things were apparent. One is it, it would be really hard for anybody to be shooting that shot from the shoulder because remember the shot's going up. I it's only four feet two off the ground. I think we're all clear that what is it? nobody was point? shooting the, the shot off the shoulder. The yeah, the point. entry point. It's only four feet two off the ground and it's going up, which means that even if you're a fairly down. short person to get that trajectory, you'd have to walk all the way up to the quail pen to get it to work. So what I was seeing here is that the most likely way that that shot was made was from a low position, like shooting low on the hip. So I took this scanned in person with a blackout and I pushed the gun down about as far as I could push it. When you say about as far as you could push it, what do you mean by that? Well, eventually at, at some point you have to have your hand on the, the trigger and the gun. And so in, instead of having the person stand straight up too, I just put them in a shooting position. I don't know what the position. Rachel, I am was, not involved is, with any this is a coming up productions okay, on what Netflix. Is this telling us? So that's what I did here. And what, degree line is that one on that's on the one and a half degree okay next and what does this depict that's the exact same shooter except that shooter has its barrel on the three degree line okay but he would be on the other side of maggie's body and on the other side of the doghouse correct okay next linda enjoy jury duty oh here we go with a two shooter theory Okay, now this has two individuals in it. What's what's the one behind? Uh, so those are the two. So so the shooter oh, okay. the shooter behind is the one and a half degree. The shooter in front is the uh, three degree. So that kind of gives the range of this person being able to make that shot. And so the, to me, because of several different factors, it's much more likely that the angle into the quail pen was flatter than three degrees, which uh, we talked about before. One of the main reasons is there's no shell casings over behind the doghouse. So this person up front, what 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 did you say about shell casings? There's no shell casings anywhere close to that person. And I guess, can you demonstrate for us how you, you're depicting this person, persons holding a gun? I mean, how, what, I mean, do they, you say from the hip. Yes. What does that mean? Um, how about demonstrate if that's okay, Your Honor? The judge is like, so whatever. What I would say is, is um, the thermostat looks to be set to 68 degrees. Here. Just got a real good shot of it. I put it down here, about as low as I could go. Okay. And, you could and go and lower than that. Like a shooting stance, like a shooting position. You're not aiming, but at least you're not aiming in the right. traditional if sense. But you're, if you're aiming, it'd be on your shoulder, right? Right. Okay. So I just I stretched that gun down until I could just still keep my hand. I thought I was shooting a gun. Now, from the shoulder, where where generally would they be? You got, I mean, to have that downward shot. It's really hard to put a shoulder shot on that trajectory just because it's so low. Because even a small person going like this, four foot four foot two, even if you put the barrel on the quail, and it'd be above the hole. So, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, next slide, please. And so this is without the guy up front because you concluded this is where the person would have been. Yes, for a person of this height, this is this is to me oh, because of its I'll proximity save that so I can talk a little bit more. the empty shell casings. Okay, next. I agree that two no, person the theory yeah, doesn't exclude next. Alec. I agree with that. Okay, now explain that green line. That's an odd uh, choice. The green of line here is the shot trajectory into the doghouse, mm -hmm. and this is this is the same shooter again, and it looks like he's standing on the sheet there. But I agree. All that would tell me if this did occur, then the body was not there. This was a shot would have come before the body fell to the ground. That is correct, and so again, you have a shooter low on the hip. Um, that's where that person would have to be to follow that upward line. So the same exact shooter. Now that shooter is shooting down, I slid that person on the line until it was shooting down. And what I discovered was it's basically in the exact same spot. 
you know, maybe one step away, maybe two steps away, but the two shots are made. I agree. The shooter could kneel very close to each other. Right. So now what we've done and is the two shots cross each other at a point, And at that point is right beside where the shell casings were ejected. But also you could have the prosecution asked if somebody Maggie was, was move, made, moving right? this way. Correct. And somebody um, could so have moved from, that way. The witnesses that, yes. He is. Strike that. Withdraw. What, if anything, did we hear from the state's experts about the relative position of Maggie and whoever shot him? There's no foundation. Did he sit in there and listen? Um, the only thing that I heard was is that maybe two of the shots were done at, at less than three feet because of the stippling to the skin. And what about the, the relative I remember position that. of the shooter and her prior to that? Uh, yes, it is almost lunchtime. For us. Nothing, nothing specific or definitive. Okay. So, and yes, um, I am happy it's almost lunchtime. Let's see the next one. What is that? This is a shooter because this shot's going down. This shooter is shooting from the shoulder, which can be done with this shot. And if you're shooting from the shoulder, you got to be further back. So that's that's just to illustrate. That's the range of possibility, you know, from the, from shoulder, the shoulder, from the hip, or down low those right. two we just saw is that also consistent with where the shell casings are it is it, that that could be consistent too. Okay. it could be consistent and the defense has the same the same Go things ahead. that the state has to deal with with their experts the experts are so like what this, this could be what happened so nobody was a, there except the shooter, the shooter and the victims making both shots so could be could be and you'll see and, I, and there, there's a couple different angles i could show you but they're really close and they're in the right location relative to the empty shell casings. Okay. So what that says, it, it's not, I'm not saying it's exactly there because there's some variables to it, but I find it interesting that the two shot trajectories cross at a point where both shots can be made and they're at the right location relative to those empty shell casings. So in my opinion, when these two shots were made, at least these two shots, that the shooter was standing right in that area. Okay, next. And what does this depict? This is the same um, thing I just described, except a little bit different angle. So there you may have a, a shooter taking two steps forward, depending on which one was fired first, right. or two steps backwards. backwards. And they can't but, say which one was you know, fired within first. Within a generally Nobody small can. area, those where those shots were fired from. Okay, next. Is that the same? That is the same thing that, you know, the shooters from the hip. And again, they're assuming if, the if you have the shooter bounce. shooting from the hip, it makes a lot of sense that with a little bit of movement, the shooter can produce both of those shots and have it agree with the evidence that uh, Special Agent Worley collected. Okay, next. Okay, now we're going to go, go to a highlights. His, uh, Heights. Sorry. I, my brain read that wrong. I was like, what? Based on your analysis of, and tell us how you came to conclude the, the range of heights for the person shooting from those distances. Tell us how that works. Okay, so. Yes, they are in fact saying opposite the tracks. So Thank we're you, able Ricky. to locate the weapon, where the weapon was, and that's. Now, that, when you say locate the weapon, what do you mean by that? Locate the weapon on the green line. Okay, so. You say locate it said the weapon heights, on, it did the say muzzle, heights. Is it the, the whole is barrel. It? The whole barrel right okay. because the bullet starts its path inside the barrel and when it leaves the barrel it finds the target okay so you can slide that barrel up and down the green line correct okay tell us how you get to a height for the shooter so for the purposes of what i've been showing you is is that i started putting different height people in the trajectory analysis of and course. so what i've been showing you is a person that's five foot two Versus how tall? The five, shooter's how tall? Five foot two. Why'd you pick five two? Could be someone a little taller crouching down a little bit? Could be. Five three, five four? Yes. So between five two and five four? Yeah. The shooter. Because uh, what so happens what degree if, of scientific if you put certainty? a five four person even, or five five, five six, um, in kind of that shooting position from the hip, you've got to move them all the way up to the quail pen. And it doesn't make any sense there because there's no shell casings. And it starts to not make any sense. Why would a person stand right in front of the quail pen a few feet away and shoot into it? And as and, you slide it back, what happens in terms of the, and, and this is all trigonometry? These are angles? It's just trigonometry. 
It's just so trigonometry, again, friends. You have five, two people. What happens is if if I move those people back, um, well, just take the quail pen to begin with. Yeah, with you're going to have to move if, them if back. You start to move the shoot of the quail pen back. Then you're down to you start getting to you know less than five foot two very quickly because that that shot is going up and. Going what you up what you have here is that you know, this is as far back as is, okay. is basically I could justify putting a, a five two shooter. Here. And how did you come to five two? I mean, what did you look at any data? Well, again, these these are actual people that were scanned in, okay. and so so these are five two. What happens is, for instance, if you you know I tried it with a five four, I tried it with a five nine. <laughs> it what, just why didn't that work? because it puts the person under the shed close to the quail pen doesn't make much sense being under there there are no shell casings there so in order to get the shooter at the cross of the two shot trajectories near the empty casings then you've got to you've got to lower that shot okay next slide please okay let's let's look at this Okay, some measurements. We don't need to look at each one of these, but go ahead. They are go trying ahead. to exclude Alec. That was now, fast. Let's hold on for one second. Well, that. Um, that was so fast. In terms of Alec Murdoch, who is that was oddly quick. Six three six four. Okay, and um, he took a measurement of him this morning, correct? Yes. And what did you measure? I measured to his kneecap. To his kneecap. Yes. And how how much um, what was what was the distance between with or the without bottom shoes, of his foot and his kneecap? Twenty five inches. So they're trying to measure you know, how tall Alec is on a knee. To what we're talking about. Well, I mean, the obvious question is is well, what if you were six four and not five two? What does that mean? So that is the obvious what question. What that means is, is that, that the shooting hand, the bottom of the shooting hand, for somebody the height of Alex Murdoch, would be right add and below his kneecap so his shooting hand would be below his kneecap yes oh god this what does is that tell you uncomfortable well it it puts the shooter or whoever fired the weapon if they were that tall it puts them in a, in a uh, an unrealistic shooting position it's not an aiming position it's not a shooting position i don't think there was a lot um, of aiming i don't think we ever said these were well aimed shots i don't think anyone ever argued that a, you know, a, a shooting position where you were on your feet. So it would be, um, again, it would be very diff difficult. You would have to be bending over and have your shooting hand down at or below your kneecap. And what's important about that to me is, is that um, it just, just makes it very unlikely that a tall person made that shot. Okay. Um, okay. More likely than... It'd be more likely that a person between five two and five four. So this is shot. the battle of the experts. Yes. Yes. And the jury will find it persuasive or not. Can I have um? Yeah. There's lots of things happening. Maybe. Now, let's see if these cameras are better and see what's happening. Can I have a red or black pen or something? You know. So this is a blow up. Take the red one. This is a blow up of the video being demonstrated yeah, for the right jury. Thanks. So I had one of these the, the shots you had with the two the shooters and their alignment. All right, up. that's better. Can you step down here, please? And then the point. Very interested to see what happens. And let's see how we can do this. You stand over here. This is a small courtroom, so these things are very difficult. And so explain to the jury why they've got to be five foot two on this blown up. Um, why would it be five foot two? Why they've got to be five foot two. If, if this guy they've moves got to forward be. this way. Either one of them move forward. 
what happens to the barrel of the gun? Yeah, so what happens is that if you move them forward, they can be taller up until a point where we talked about before. At some point in time, even shooting from the hip, you still have to be very close to the quail pen. When he's holding it like if this, he's not shooting back, from the hip. Either two things have to happen is, is they have to be even shorter than 5'2", or they have to be in some unnatural or um, kind of like an unreasonable shooting position. I mean, obviously you could... Obviously that happens, though. ...on the ground, taking a shot. They could be really low of any height, right? So, but what I'm, what I'm doing here is, is that as you move these people back, the gun has to be lower and lower and lower to the ground. When you move it forward, the gun has to be higher. So then you start looking at, well, where are the shell casings? The shell casings are here. So if you move a person back, let's say where they're laying on the ground, right? And they're shooting like in a sniper position, like on their elbows and laying down flat, there's no shell casings back there because the shell casings are being ejected to the right, maybe to the back, we don't really know. But at least it's gonna be back To the here. right and a little to this the back, area where possibly. Maggie's body was found where the, the collection of empty shell casings are found because some of these were close range but some of them are spread over here is going to put the shooter here which well, certainly puts the weapon there and then the net, then what you have to do is go through the thought process of how can somebody hold the weapon that height off the ground so now if you've got a tall person and they're coming this I bet way, you on redirect the state's going to bring in or on re um, on their rebuttal the state will bring in a firearms person. expert to talk about can, can all the different they, ways you can shoot a gun. How close they have to be to the quail pen to shoot the bullet at that angle um, into the quail pen? Well, it would be difficult. It wouldn't be either a hip shot or a shoulder shot. You would have to, for somebody who's tall, because again, um, I don't have a tape measure, but the hole in the quail pen is a four foot two okay so we got one right there so let's just say i see a sticker or something you need what a sticker so quail pen shot is right here they have a clear sticker right there Okay. So that's, that's I mean, we've got both sides trying to give the jury okay. theories so on what three, coulda, shoulda, coulda, woulda, kind of coulda happened so it's to explain the bullet trajectories. So there's, I'm saying that's about flat. Let's just say that's three degrees. And I'm standing at the quail pen. I would have to do like that. Or I could do this. Right? Not from the hip. I'd have to come in here like this, which, of course, is possible. Right? Just like that. About six four, and if you're six four, it would be you know a lot taller than I am, and so you would you know you would have to go through that thought process of how the shooter could. could and of course, them. as you come back off the quail pen, the only place you see shell casings are back here. Yes, the sh empty shell casings. There's some right by the body. There's one underneath the body, and then I believe it's two, three, and four are here. Five, six, and seven are here, but two, three, and four are here. Like the shells are being ejected to the right and maybe slightly backwards. And so, can you say to a degree of engineering certainty, more probably than not, that whoever shot this shot or these shots, well, first of all, the quail band shot was five, two to five, four? That is the most likely explanation, yes. Most okay. likely explanation. And, and weird we shit that, happens um, when crimes happen, though. Six, four. Oh, yes. So could you say to a degree of engineering, certainly more probably than not, that Alec Murdoch on the night of June 7th did not file that, fire that shot into the quail pen? In my opinion, it's, it's very unlikely that he fired that shot. Okay, now, um, in reviewing the sweat file, did you see whether or not... And that's the reason uh, he says, by, in his opinion, uh, it's unlikely like so that Alec Murdoch fired these any shots. Pharaohs, anything indicating the sweat ever looked at these uh, shot at this before. No. Okay, go ahead and take the, uh, And that's the other point. Did SLED ignore these shot trajectories? Your Honor, this is probably going to go another extended, probably another hour. Oh, um, God, I'm why? Look at, see, it's one o'clock. I don't know what you, you want me to continue or do you want to take a lunch break? He puts the judge in a rough spot. Break for lunch now. That's what you want to do. Because. <laughs>
It's clearly what Poot wants to do. Uh, Poot wants to scoot scoot to lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, so we will... The one thing we can rely on Poot for is taking a break when I'm ready to take a break. He's been consistent. Addressing the jury. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll break now and we'll return at 2.15. Please do not discuss the case. 2.15 p.m. ET. I will be back roughly around 110 Central. We're going to just wait and see what the court says as they're dismissing. I'm going to run through a few questions and then I am going to get some food. But I do appreciate the one thing, though there are plenty of things that annoy me about Dick Harputlian. At the end of the day, when he's like, your honor, now's a good time to break. I'm like, yes. So the man motivated by let's be done. And I am also sometimes motivated by let's be done. In this fifth week of the three-week murder trial, I'm beginning to feel like we were on a three-hour cruise and we are now living on Gilligan's Island. I don't know what's happening. I'm going to wait and see if the court addresses. Oh, he said, I'll see you back after lunch or something of that effect. The mics are cut. It looks like the judge is just dismissing everybody. Um, but I hate it when the mics are cut when the court is addressing the attorneys. Because we can't hear what he's saying, obviously. Because the mics are cut. Okay. With that, we are breaking for lunch. We're going to answer some questions. I'm going to try to give a summary of the morning real quick, and then we'll do some questions. But I can't believe there's another hour left of this. I mean, okay, another hour, another hour, another hour, another hour. But we know this witness is going to testify to other things than the bullet trajectories. They qualified him as an expert. Well, let me do a summary. They qualified him as an expert in three places. All right, let me do, let me do a summary. We've moved. We're now moving the moving screens around. All right. So this morning started off with the court questioning Jim Griffin about a tweet that he sent over the weekend, whether there is, there is, I don't think any debate that it was in fact a quote tweet and not a direct retweet because it was a quote tweet where he quoted the headline. He said he didn't give any commentary, but he restated the headline of an article about this case that is up and on Twitter. The court made a comment about that. They lost another juror due to illness. The juror had gone to the doctor. No further information on what that was or wasn't, but the doc, the juror wasn't feeling well, went to the doctor, and then was dismissed from jury duty. We are now down to two alternates. The defense also said that they think they will be done on Friday, but then we are going into week six with the prosecution's rebuttal case in this trial that is going to double in length, which is really difficult for the jurors um, to deal with when they expected a three-week trial, when we all expected a three-week trial, wrapping your head around sitting here for another week and a half is quite a lot. It seems that the rebuttal case maybe will take a few days, and they're hoping to get this case to the jury maybe a week from Wednesday. So that's where we're at scheduling-wise. Then they called Buster Murdoch to the stand to talk about the family's habits that they vacationed together the properties they had, the text messages that they sent, the way they communicated, and talk about where people would park at his grandparents' house to, I think, explain Alex's uh, GPS points around the backside of the house near the other outbuildings. And we finally saw some pictures of that property at Almeda, which we hadn't seen before. We'd seen maps and overhead shots, but nobody even bothered to take pictures, it seems, from the prosecution side or sled of the home at Almeda, though. It factors heavily into their investigation. That's where the raincoat tarp situation was found. There were no pictures of the exterior, but also the prosecution didn't have those GPS plot points, so maybe they didn't realize how important it was to their case. I think that they should have, based on Shelly Smith's testimony about them coming over at 6.30 in the morning and moving vehicles around, you think you would want to explain vehicles were moved off the train tracks and they went here and there. Who knows why they didn't do it, but they sure didn't. Okay. I'm my camera, my camera trajectory moved because Fred was messing with it last week. And I still don't feel like centered either way. We're trying to ground on the screen. Bull Buster testified. It was a brief cross-examination. Um, and we heard that Buster's grandpa had always been kind to Metters when Metters was a young attorney general. Again, emphasizing that it's not just the defense lawyers that are intertwined here in this case, but the prosecution as well because of the small area um, where this case happened and how they all do know each other. Then we got into the defense's expert, their first expert that they've called. I don't consider coroner fingers and pits to count as an expert. That was weird on Friday. 
we got into an expert talking about bullet trajectories. At the very end of that testimony, they opined that the shooter was most likely between five foot two and five foot four. And the most likely explanation is that Alec Murdoch is not the shooter. That was the end. We still have at least an hour of that testimony to go after lunch. Um, that lunch video is populated. If you want to go hit notify me, that's on the homepage of my YouTube channel. If you are new here and have not done the subscribe things and the like things, if you would like to do those things, please don't forget to do them. I appreciate it. It lets YouTube know that people enjoy um, coverage with commentary so that more people can find coverage with commentary. And with that, we are going to go to um, we are going to go to some questions, and then I am going to get lunch. I definitely need it. This morning has made my brain tired. <laughs> um, cause it takes a lot of foundation to get to the testimony that we really want to get to. And the testimony we wanted to get to is what is this expert's opinion? Truly what's their opinion. So with that, um, let's get to some questions. It's time to fuck around. Fact, fact. We're gonna fact around. We're gonna we're gonna kind of speed run some questions, and then we are all going to take a moment for some lunch. Aaron said, "At a 32 inch inseam on myself, it is like 16 inches off of my height, and legs are a big part of that, for sure. How long someone's torso is, all of it. Um, we'll just see." Um, Lilith said, are they setting up the short groundskeeper? I have no idea how tall the groundskeeper is. We've not heard any testimony about that. I don't know how tall cousin Eddie Smith is either. Um, I asked y'all if this was helpful for visualizing the crime scene. 78% of you said yes. 21% said no. I imagine the 21% that said no have great mental visualizations. So hearing the descriptions probably already worked, but it was nice to get to see them walk through the crime scene with the exhibits on screen. We didn't get to see that during the prosecution's case. Then the tech sorted out. So now we do see the exhibits. It's helpful for me to see them while I'm hearing the testimony. It keeps me more engaged, even though this testimony wasn't the most engaging. That is exactly the same for the state's case. It wasn't the foundational. This person's here and that person's there is not the most engaging. But if you can't see it, it's absolutely impossible. The chat is saying Eddie Smith is six foot one. So there we go. So there, there we go. Roro said a few good men was on this weekend. Always a fun one to watch over and over. You can't handle the truth. Missy said the defense is using Occam's razor as a defense. They sure are going that direction. Is that exhibit lawful law? We had some exhibits that are, some exhibits that aren't in this case. MLC said Poots Dick reminds me so much of Durst attorney Dick DeGruelen with his theatrics reenactments and being honored to represent his friend who is known to have committed other reprehensible acts. There are a lot of parallels there that I can see. API said this is persuasive to me if they also measured AM on a knee or squatting and the measurements don't line up in that range. Fair point. And the jury might be asking the same thing. Uh, a lot of you asked, Lisa asked, and a lot of others asked, um, wouldn't you be kneeling? Um, not if on the knee, but or um, not if on knee, but on foot, gun on shoulder. I don't know. Um, casings don't always eject the same. That's true. I've had one eject and get caught between my safety glasses and my eye. Ouch. I've had them eject down my shirt, even when I wear like zip up because the girls, we don't want them to get stuck in the girls. I've still had casings get stuck in the girls. It is not a pleasant feeling. Lucinda said, so it was a woman, Kevin Hart or the dancing baby that or they took a knee like a hunter. Hunters definitely do um, can. I, I don't, I've never hunted game. I've shot for target practice and sport and well, target shooting and archery, but um, I don't know. It seems possible. The defense is going to make it as improbable as they can. That is their, that is their, um, that is their role really in all of this is to doubt where is the reasonable doubt. And is this reasonable doubt? Um, is this enough doubt? Hey, this shooter had to be like five, four. I don't know. Does it, does it put doubt in the jury's mind after they've seen the sketch that Alec had police make about the roadside incident after hearing the roadside incident? Are they looking at this going? Sure. It was somebody who was five, two. 
Just like it was a handsome young man with a green truck. Uh Uh-huh. Great. Sure. I don't know. And we won't know. Do they know these two shots hit Maggie? One of them didn't. There are seven shell casings, but Maggie was hit four to five times. And there were, there were seven casings. Maggie was hit four or five times. There was one section of fragmenting in the gravel. So if Maggie was hit five times, there was one sectioning of gravel, fragment in the gravel, and there was one bullet in the doghouse. So that would account for seven. I find this witness very helpful. 6-4 doesn't make sense, but 6-4 on knees puts you around 5-2. They need to explain the knee issue on cross or it will just, or they need to explain the knee issue or cross will just uh, destroy the guy's whole theory. They started to talk about it for sure. Um, thanks to whoever gifted me a membership. Day 17 p.m. You are welcome. There have been lots of gifted memberships today. Thank you all for those. It And if you are newly gifted a membership, you can go back and access the members only live streams and go watch those. Charlene said, I'm five, one. My ex was six, three. When he kneeled, we were about even. If we fired guns, um, a shot from my hip would have been his from his shoulder. Did I read that? Well, if we fired guns, a shot from my hip would have been his at his shoulder. I don't quite under, I might've inverted it in my brain because I'm tired. So talking about knees, can we acknowledge that people can use them to kneel? (laughs) We can. We can definitely use them to acknowledge people can kneel. Did I miss when this man was admitted as an expert in bio? They didn't object at all. They said, can he be admitted as an expert? And the prosecution said, no objection. So there we are. There was definitely much more kicking over who the experts were in depth. We heard there's not been a lot of that in this case. Elspeth said, did I miss when this man was admitted? Oh, we got that. No, you didn't. It, it went quick and the prosecution didn't object. I did not have Poot argued Maggie and Paul were murdered by the lollipop guild on my bingo card for the day. Andrea said, could explain the water if he had mud on his knee. Maybe. Um, they, he was super clean, so there it was. I want Alec Murdoch to confess and tell us what really happened out there so we can see whose theory or expert was closest to figuring it out. I don't think we're ever going to hear that. I wonder, I imagine the next testimony will be how sound travels and explaining why maybe Alec wouldn't have heard the gunshots. I don't know. If the dogs were out there, wouldn't it make sense to shoot upwards so you know you won't hit a dog? I don't think, this doesn't seem to be a planned murder. This, especially with Maggie, it seems scattered. So I think it was trying to adjust to the situation. Weird things happen. And I don't know if we ever get them right when you're trying to explain what happens because weird things happen in the heat of a moment for most people, it's not normal that they do this. Most people who commit murders are not serial killers. They don't kill and kill and kill and kill. So it's a very dynamic, unusual heightened situation when these things happen. So it's hard to take rational brain and explain a very dynamic and irrational act that it's hard to think through how that could happen. The evidence will tell some and will give ranges and proximities, but you never quite know. How do you know the quail pen hole is related if no bullet was found there? It's a hunting property. That's a fair point too. They're guessing that it is, and no one has challenged that assumption. If the jury thinks two shooters, does that mean not guilty due to the way charges were brought? No, they could think he's one of them. He's charged with shooting Maggie and Paul. He, It doesn't mean he did that alone. The state's theory is he did it alone, though. So if the jury doesn't believe the state's theory, it's more likely that they will find him not guilty because the state's theory is he did it alone. But the jury can come to an in-between and be like, we don't quite believe what the state says. We don't believe what the defendant says. This is what we think. Remember, the jury is the finder of fact. They get to determine what happened. And their, their determination of what happened goes. So they might disregard everybody's theories and be like, this is what we have seen. And then they decide that way. I think in this case, the digital evidence is going to be very helpful to the jury. I think the timeline is going to be helpful to the jury, whichever way they decide. And I think experts like this will be interesting, but there's competing experts and they will decide what they think. Nicole, the shell casings are the same marks, so that doesn't exclude two shooters, at least in Maggie's case. Um, I think with the two guns, the theory would be that one gun for each shooter, but I don't think they're, I don't think they're arguing that there were two shooters holding blackouts. Maybe they are, and I missed it. It would be an interesting theory. If he bent down getting the gun off the ground, the angle could be correct. The gun was probably hidden. Um, Or, yeah, or picking it up. I wonder if he's going through Alex's mind right now, thinking 
he did it. If he did it, he is probably imagining that night. And as he is seeing these experts, I don't know. Maybe shooter could have been kneeling down to aim, could have, or could have gone down to a knee as Maggie was moving to stabilize themselves in the. If you assume that whoever shot Paul then picked up a different gun and shot Maggie, you could be stabilizing yourself because of emotion, adrenaline, or whatever, too. Question, if Netflix did consult with you, when would you recommend they release the Murdoch doc? Um, I have found from all the work I have done with Legacy Media that there is never, never asked. I, When I work with Legacy Media, I am just a subject matter expert. Nobody asks me anything. I imagine for Netflix, right in the middle of the defense case of the trial is generally when people get more interested in the case anyway. And so people are interested in this case, maybe because we're all talking about it here together, or maybe because it's just, we're now in the middle of it and it's being televised. They are going to try to maximize viewership and they think that this is the best time. I don't think Netflix cares about anything other than maximizing viewership, truly. Question, hubby wants to know where to take me for anniversary dinner in Nashville, Murfreesboro area. Barba Fett, I'm sure there will be lots of thoughts here. It depends on how fancy you want to go. It's also restaurant week this week in Nashville. I really enjoy Mojo's Tacos at the factory, um, but I also don't always need a fancy schmancy dinner. We went, where did we go that I loved? Oh, Adele's downtown. If you want a nice dinner, farm to table, homemade fresh every day, changing menu, Adele's in downtown is so freaking good. So freaking good. Um, it's so freaking good. It's one of my favorite places. So when people come into town, it's the one place I'm like, we have to go to Adele's. The drinks are great. The food is great. The location is great. Love it. So Adele's like this spelled like the singer in Nashville. Laura said, question, what about reports this weekend that Alec was Googling restaurants in Edisto after calling 911? That was in evidence last week. That was in evidence last week. He was Googling restaurants in Edisto. That was happening. What about Jim Griffin speaking in the HBO Max documentary? That made me real uncomfortable. Yep, nobody brought it up. Nobody's argued about it. I think I think it could go either way. And we've seen other cases where the attorneys argue over, over what particular attorney said in public. The rules of professional conduct are not super clear on that stuff. So did you catch judge said attorney witness I didn't hear the judge said it, say attorney witness, but I think the judge has feelings about how involved the defense is with some of the witnesses in this case, because Jim did talk to some of the witnesses um, and is a witness to some things himself. Krista said, I chatted last week with my sister uh, that my sister was in labor. She had her baggie Maggie, Maggie Jo. She was flown to the NICU and would appreciate good thoughts. Maggie Jo and Krista's sister were sending you all the good thoughts. Want to update because the chat was so nice before. My um, my oldest is a NICU kiddo, and it is a stressful time that your kiddo will not remember. The parents are left much more shaken than that, but we have a thriving, healthy, wonderful kiddo, and um, and their time in the NICU is something that stays with me. The NICU nurses were the most incredible humans in helping us take care of our family, and then when T came home, it was a little weird. It's like, oh, now we're home. So remind your sister to eat and to sleep and to take care of herself before Maggie Jo comes home because she is recovering from a birth, recovering from having a kid in the NICU, which is an emotional and a whole emotional thing. So remind her to recover and remind her that the NICU nurses are the best hands and they've got you. So make sure that she takes care of herself. I wish I had um, taken better care of myself when my kid was in the NICU. I ended up uh, not doing great, but I had also had a lot of health issues going into um, going into Travis's birth, so I'm not surprised. William Taylor, um, being hunters, laying, kneeling, crouching, etc., would not be an odd way to shoot an animal or what, whatever. How tall is AM if he's on his knees with butt on his heels? That's fair. I need measurements. And that's a fair point, too. They are avid hunters. So being in all different kinds of positions, it's like you get used to doing the things that you do, right? Um... The neurodivergent counselor, I may be wrong, but I feel like both parties are so weird about questioning B because he's the son of the victims. Yeah, it's hard. It's a very difficult cross-examination that needs to be done delicately. Alex said in a police interview, Buster said they didn't replace the 300 blackout. Stood out to me because Alec said he thought they did. And Buster said that here, that he didn't. And question as a former prosecutor, what hard questions do you think appropriate and not go against 
you to ask Buster on cross. I think it would be, um, I think it would be fair to ask Buster that he didn't feel afraid, ask if his dad, but you, it's hard for me to tell what questions I would ask. I would have needed to see his interview. I would have looked at what he said in his interview and asked some of those questions. It was fair to say, well, this grass looks fine. It doesn't look like people are regularly parking on this lawn, but there's not a ton you're going to get from Buster. And lighting into Buster in a really difficult cross-examination is just going to make a jury angry. Even if the jury doesn't love Buster's vibe or, or thinks he's maybe protecting his dad, the jury's not going to love everything Buster's been through. They're not going to love a prosecutor really getting into Buster a lot. I think asking about personal safety was a fair question, but there wasn't too much. There wasn't too much there. Buster definitely wasn't concerned for his life. Um, sure didn't seem to be. Are future witnesses allowed in the courtroom when other witnesses are testifying? In this court, they are, and I don't know why, but it's weird. Question, do you really think the defense will finish this week? I think the defense is, I think the defense is estimating their time based on flying in experts, so I trust their time estimate. By the way, it's my birthday. Can I have a shout out? Yamie J, happy birthday. Oh, it's getting late. I need to go eat. We're we're giving you a screaming goat. We're going to have to go. We're going to have to go eat lunch. To the super chats that I missed, I'm sorry. I will try to take a look at them at them as we go. I try to pull them up as we go. And with that, I will see you after lunch. This stream should dump you over there if you want to go hop in the chat. Don't forget to hit the notification bell. Join me back here after lunch to see. Well, I think this is probably the witness we have for the rest of the day, don't you? I think this, I think we live here now. We just live here now. I didn't roll the intro this morning. Let's roll the outro now and um enjoy some lunch. I'm gonna go get some all dressed chips. That's definitely gonna be on the plate for lunch today. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>